episode 15. So Pete, just before we kick off, we should probably acknowledge the presence of the cameras that are here. Um, do we get to keep that bit where we went clack? Do we no, get to keep that No, you don't in get there? the clacker. But people can now, you can listen to us or people can watch us hold court as well. Okay. Um, we're, so, you know, we're trying to, as I explained, we're trying to improve the quality and the frequency of how we're doing it. So that's why we're here now in the new studios in Holborn, just around the corner from the Royal College of Surgeons. Yeah, just around the corner from my old bank. Just literally next door, which is now Sainsbury's, used to be the central central part of um, HSBC. And I remember when I was a student, I went in there one day and the lady literally cut up my card in front of me. Can I, can I just see your card quickly? Yeah. Took it off and she cut it up right in front of After me. After rag week or something. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The Royal College of Surgeons would have a fit if they knew what we were doing here. Um, it's interesting because people said you were too ugly for camera. <laughs> they said you should stick to podcasts. Never. I'm not too ugly for camera. But, you know, I just want to say that's not fair. The fact is I think you're too ugly for any medium. <laughs> I'd just like to apologise to anyone at home who's turning on the ca uh, camera now and just watching and they can see sloth from the Goonies on their screen. <laughs> hey, you guys. Uh, anyway, uh, just cover your eyes whenever you hear uh, Pete's voice and I'd like to introduce our guest. We're joined today by Mr. Tom J. Quick, also known by what I assume to be his government name of Thomas Jefferson Quick. Is it Jefferson, you think? I think it's Johansson. Johansson, sorry, Johansson. Thomas Johansson Quick, or his Twitter handle of uh, TJQPNI, aka the Nerve Nerd, his words, not mine, but as we like to call him, the Sultan of Saltatory Conduction. <laughs> Tom was educated at Manchester Grammar School. It's great to see a fellow grammar school boy here. I was at the RGS in High Wycombe. And then he studied medicine at Magdalen College, Cambridge, which is spelt Magdalene, and graduated in art history. So now your tweets are making sense. Uh, Tom went, did his clinical training at UCL, basic surgical training in London and Sydney, Australia. SPR training was in Bristol, or as the locals call it, Brizzle. And it's followed by a fellowship in paediatric orthopaedics at Westmead Children's Hospital, Sydney and then 18 months of fellowship training at the renowned peripheral nerve injury unit at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital, Stanmore. You clearly kept your nose clean because they offered you a job there as a consultant in 2013. And you've been there for eight years. This is almost like this is your life, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> is he missing anything out no, here? Yeah, is, is a, it... a lot, but I don't think <laughs> okay. that much we need to cover. <laughs> yeah. So subsequently, you were the head of undergraduate surgical education at UCR Medical School. You hold honorary appointments at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Sick Children and the Evelina Children's Hospital here in Her Majesty's London Tan. And Tom was awarded an MD a few years ago on the assessment of renovated, renovated? Re-innovated. Re-innovated muscle oh. function, apologies. Is apologies. that hyphenated? Yeah, it's, it's contentious, but I do. Tom, it's yeah. not, honestly, it's not my first language, so I struggle with these things. <laughs> and he's an associate, honorary, honorary associate professor in, in the Institute of Musculoskeletal Science at University College London. Tom, welcome. There's, you've missed out one critical bit. What's that? He's just been nominated, made the nerve surgeon for Iceland. For the whole of Iceland? For the whole of Iceland. He is the nerve surgeon for the whole of freaking Iceland. As opposed to the, the superstore. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, they get a lot of ice they injuries, get, they right? Get, you put your hand in those freezers, You're anything done for. can happen. Can't feel anything. Neuropathic pain for the next 20 and, years. And actually, I forgot to say, and also, apologies, Tom is an ABC fellow. Soon to be, hopefully. Yeah. Soon to be, a big deal. It's been... Uh, this little um, virus has got in the way, but that's all there. Are you ready for that, that drunken drunken tour? Are you ready? Is your liver up to it, do you think? Yeah, I just think it's going to be on Zoom now. So I think that's oh, going to okay. be just oh, man. drinking games <laughs> over video. I think that's what it's going to be. Just in your pants. Yeah. Just how I like it. <laughs> so Pete um, wanted to talk to you in particular. So you've achieved a lot. We're going to pick your brain today, but Tom, Pete wants to talk to you about open water swimming. Let's kick off with swimming. Yeah, good. Because okay. not everyone's good at swimming, right? Not everyone has a natural aptitude to swimming. What, 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 where, where did swimming start with you? Were you just like, you jumped in a pool when you were a kid and you were yeah, awesome at I it? Was, I was thrown in tiny tanks. That my mum swam. Loved it. it. Took me when I was, I don't know, really tiny. I've been in the pool. Really small. And then, just before I got to 40, you know that back pain sets in, you feel old, you feel big. And I wasn't. Yeah. 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 Were, were you like a competition swimmer? Were you like? Were your parents ferrying around the country no. going to galas so and this, that, went, and the other? I went, but then never really competed. Did a bit of swimming, club swimming, but never really did much competing. Then got into water polo. So played water That's polo. Pretty violent, huh? great game. Yeah. yeah, particularly mixed water polo. That's all. Water sport. <laughs> now I'm interested. Um, now I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so I played at school um, and university, but that, the style of swimming there, the sprinting, the sort of chest out, mm. out the water is really bad for then doing any kind of distance swimming. So to get 
not old, got back pain, so what am I going to do? What sport? You know, given up rugby, broken my fingers, nothing to do. So I got back into swimming, joined the club again, masters, old old person swimming. Right, the real thing. Veterans. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Vets. <laughs> That's cool. But how do you and get outdoors? That's yeah, the where, where's the outdoorsy thing come from? Really bad at turning. In the pool. You know you're supposed to do the tumble turn. Yeah. I can't curl in a ball small enough. That's so legs, head, hitting. Things. It's all a bit of a mess. That's off the wrong direct. Like daddy long legs exactly. stuck against a window. So much, <laughs> so much better <laughs> if you don't have to turn. You just, right. just plug on. Just keep on going. So that was, so the lake's good, but you end up going in circles. Yeah. And I got into the ocean. There's a thing in deep water though, isn't there, where you get a bit of vertigo, where you, you kind of, you know you're way out of your depth, but you're not quite sure how much, and you, your mind starts telling you it's very, very deep. It's probably not that deep at all, but it tell, your mind's always oh, very deep here. Because I, I only like swimming in water where I know where the bottom is, right? Preferably kind of heated to above room temperature. And, and in a pool, you can see the bottom, even if you can't yeah, touch yeah. it. But in, in, in dark water, it's kind of... In a pool, if there's a floater in the pool, you'll see that. In the sea, yeah. you're blissfully right. unaware. Right, yeah. just as... Doof. Exactly. What we, <laughs> but I was in... Um, I did a swim uh, around the Isles of Croatia. Beautiful, clear, blue, blue sea with tiny, tiny jellyfish. All yeah. over you, just swimming. Mm. The, bl- the, the light coming in and the... And the, and the blue and it was it was it was you, you can focus on nothing because there's there's no there's nothing to focus on yeah you just head in, in the water it's just pure blue color yeah um beautiful but yeah i was over um swimming and and that beneath you you're not sure what depth things come across at speed is dark is that mm. tuna yeah. is that whatever yeah. Yeah. but big things. stuff not like, yeah, like big stuff and quick and you yeah. and because it's low yeah. You've got no depth perception as to what size, you know, is yeah. that something? Mm. And there is that constant fear of the Kraken. Yeah. You know, wherever it's going to come that's up. Right. Yeah. Fear the Kraken. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, but it's just, so that's all this, it's that fear. And I did really, you know, I had the fear. Yeah. You do, you get that. Oh, what, but you go, look, I've just got to keep going, turn yeah. your arms over. And that was what the pool told you. It's just, just keep swimming. That's what the coach will say. It's like, how many more lengths? Just keep swimming. We stop yet, just keep swimming. And that's, you just got to just turn. Sounds turn. pretty sadistic. Yeah, so the marathon, I, I did a 10K uh, ocean swim, normal. Yeah. That was, yeah, you just, so I'd never done endurance swimming. Never been. And it's in the ocean, so you're against waves and all sorts. Yeah, of and jellyfish and yeah. whatever else. In fact, there's a great dead, 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 dead body. How bad are jellyfish? Are they, are they, I got they a, sound terrible. I got a blue eat thing, one of these um, Portuguese man of war when I was in Australia. That was painful. Where did you get it? Not on your test. I got it down my chest and around my leg. And it left little punctate stings. I remember coming out of the water and it was, you could concentrate on nothing else but the pain. Is, is that the one that you pee on? It, it, it was. <laughs> this is, yeah. Do you see guys, said, guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> Ladies, that was your moment. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think is, they is that, sting. Is, they, is, is that like a, you know... Um, yeah, I think it's a Urban washout. myth. So quite a All lot right. are temperature sensitive. So right. warm water does tend to... Okay. But yeah, so I think maybe it's the warm... Maybe it's the warm <laughs> pee. Um, you see, because so the, the camera that said pee instead it. of piss. And I, I was just nervous. But please, yeah. So, but, so that's pretty painful. But then what? when you're doing this, are you wearing um, a neoprene sweatsuit or in kind of like budgie smugglers? Yeah, the budgies. Are they? Yeah. I've, I've got, got a lot of respect for that. But yeah. it's, yeah, I don't, it's a hassle to get in and out of. Um, just don't need it. Because you get that cold shock anyway, because the wetsuit fills up with the mm. Even in the, even the cold flight when I did the big The case takeaway, take yeah. Um, enough movie as you call this. <laughs> <laughs> was I going to get to the end of the sentence? Talking absolute yeah. gibberish. No, that was the coldest that I went. Um, and yeah, I did feel rather. Tell me, tell me about, because... I perceive that there are some health, some, well, there are some perceived health benefits to swimming in cold water. Mm. What, what's all that about? Is, is that a true thing or is that like you just a fad or where are we with that? Yeah, so it's definitely a big trend and a big fad. And I think people are taking it on and it can be really, you know, there is a danger. As we were talking yesterday, actually, the big, the big key problem is the rewarming. So you think the problem is in the water. You know, yes, you can get hypothermic and there isn't much warning of that. Poor. So your arms and your face and your legs, you get the ice cream headache, you can mm. get the pain. Um, but that's not the problem. It's the poor temperature dropping. And right. You don't feel that change. So yes, there's a problem with hypothermia. But if you know that you're sensible and you're swimming just for a few minutes and 
finding your own boundaries. The problem is when you get out, because you've got all of the blood is at that water temperature, three degrees, one degree. Yeah. And then about 10 minutes after you get out, your body says, right, let's start to rewarm, mixes all of that, and it rushes, and you feel that cold water rush back into your bore, and you get, and that's when people kick off with cardiac arrhythmias, is that cold shock, yeah. and that's called the after drop. <laughs> yeah, for, for 20 minutes. And you're given a hot chocolate, it's going over. <laughs> you get food in your mouth, yeah. you've got to get yeah. food and drink in yeah, because okay. to keep that core warm. And then I'll right. drive home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah exactly it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, you, you've got to stay there with people that know. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's not having a shower or because that, again, it warms, it drives the warmth away. Okay. So you don't want to go in a shower or, or a bath. You want to warm from the inside out, not the outside in. Okay, so a cup of drives, tea is what, where it's at. Exactly, and... and you know, res- respectfully, Tom, it sounds bloody miserable. Uh, but I love it, and it, 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 it is addictive. And I think to get back to why and what the benefits are, I do think it is that you can focus on nothing else. So there is only, I have to get to that boy and back. You versus the water. Yeah, and so there is that. So it gets rid of all the, you know, all the extraneous noise of life. You, you focus. And there is a bit of that, you know, euphoria from, from, the, from the pain. It is a... Pain loving specialty. You heard it here first, folks. Are, are, are there proof? Because I was taught at medical school, and this was quite some time ago, that when you got into like very cold conditions, you got these things called cl- cold sure. agglutinins, yeah. where you, you, your your blood becomes a little bit more coagula- coagulophilic, and so you get these Pathic. little clots. Philic. Coagulophilic. Philic. So you, you like, get these I've little clots. I've never heard that phrase. I've only heard coagulopathic. I've never heard Yeah, that suggests, suggests it won't clot, but this is I actually. It, yeah. it, like, I know what like it means, but I've never heard philic before. <laughs> I know, every day's a school day. And, Thank so, you. and so it was therefore bad for you to, to, to be like, have a sudden shock cold. So though, and the, the implication was that having cold showers and things was a bad thing. But is that right? Or have we changed, what's the science on that? Yeah, so I'm not sure I know. I do know that there was a recent study on the cold shock proteins being beneficial. So I think there are, I think in mammals in particular, there are advantages to cold exposure in terms of advantages to immune system. Now, I don't okay. know the science on any of this, but I do know there was a study at the Hampstead um, open air pool where they did a, a control group of people doing yoga on the side of the pool and those who were swimming and looked at these things called um, cold shock proteins. And that definitely peaked with that, with that exposure. Um, but I think we have such a homeostatic environment that we're not forced to homeostase ourselves. So, you know, we're wrapped up, we're indoors, we're air conditioned when it's hot, we're heated when it's cool. And I think there probably is an advantage to going back more towards exposures of extreme and having your body doing more yeah. of the homeostasis, and using so more it's of like, ca- like caveman times, right? Yeah. It's a bit like the paleo diet. Yeah, yeah. And, I think, <laughs> and I think it is no, faddy. I do think it's faddy like that. I think there's been right. a big... Um, you know, let's all go do this because it's the thing. But it, it is great. And being outside, you know, to, to swim and see a kingfisher fly by or see the sunset and all that kind of stuff. It or is a dead, definitely... or a dead body in the water. Yeah, a shopping bike. trolley. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was, I was chatting to Chloe last night about this and she was, she was saying, oh, well, uh, asking about the health benefits of, of, you know, cold exposure. Because, like, you know, when you... you Did get she also the... tell you about coagulophilic? <laughs> <laughs> that's she's, not, that's she's not your brain, word. She's the brains of yeah. the outfit. I realise. <laughs> Maybe we should bring her hair Coagulophilic is a made-up word. It's a yeah. made-up word. Just accept it. Someone Google it. And, and she, she's asking about the perceived health benefits because we, like, every, after a long dog walk, we got the dog. The dog's covered in mud. She's like a long-haired dog. So you, you hose her down in the garden. And Chloe was saying, well, if, the, if there's health benefits, we could hose you down in the garden. You could just stand there. I'll hose you down. You get all the health benefits without having to go into these swim in these freezing cold rivers. Yeah, so they've done a lot of work on exposure medicine. There's some, some yeah. very clever physiologists who, who look at that, you know, the equations of so it's body mass, it's how much heat you take with you. So when you're larger, heavier, you obviously take more mass yeah. at body temperature into that cold environment. Then the insulation, so how chubby you are helps. Um, and then just that... Oh, so, okay, so carrying a bit of body fat's a good thing. So generally, you look at those who do this, and they are on the heavier... You don't get many of the small waif-like people because they are going to get very cold yeah. very quickly. Pete, let's do it, me and you. <laughs> <laughs> we're I think, think we're, we're optimised. We're all perfectly suited. <laughs> I'm a natural. Adapted. Yeah. But you had a lot of cold showers as a teenager, you were telling me. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the same... 
<laughs> a boarding school. Yeah, yeah your parents yeah, did, yeah, really. Exactly. Do you know about Wim Hof? Are you a fan of Wim Hof? So, yeah. So I've only come to him because people have said, oh, you like this, you'll like yeah. that. Um, so he's certainly done some pretty incredible things. But again, having done it myself without any breathing methods, so I, I don't know if you know. Do you know, know who Wim Hof is? No, I don't know. Sorry, Pete's ignorant. Fill him in. <laughs> So Wim Hof is, I'm not even sure of his nationality, Dutch. He's Dutch. He's Dutch. Dutch. So he's a Dutch man who does extreme cold exposure uh, tasks. So he's okay. been, you know, you'll find him sat cross-legged on the top of a, a mountain naked in the middle of winter with the snow yeah. around him. And he's he's, he's kind of Kilimanjaro just in shorts. And he's got like the Guinness World Record for, I think, swimming under ice, longest distance under ice. And his, right. But his, his understanding of all of this is that there is an awful lot of psychological control over physiology. Yes. He does yes. his breathing. He can slow his heart rate down. Exactly, and all those things. So all he did, He was injected with um, bacterial. He took an intravenous bacterial dose and showed that he could control, you know, his immune response. Overcome his sepsis. Exactly. But so <laughs> you kind of wonder about some of the science. Um, yeah. So I know of him, and you know, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Because he's written books material, and there's but... documentaries. He's the guy's just a nutter. Yeah. But, you know, but David record... Blaine was into a bit of that, like putting himself in blocks of ice and stuff, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, controlling his heart. This rate. guy actually does it. Yeah, like David Blaine is just messing around in a box above, you know, above the Thames. Getting bored. Um, no, just because we were talking yesterday, and Pete really wanted to ask you about open water swimming because he's been preternaturally occupied with the thoughts of shrinkage. <laughs> <laughs> he's been living in the corner, going like a dormouse in the house. Like ask him about bees. 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 Okay, you're an apiarist. Yes, yes. I am. So tell us about that. Um, so I've always loved bugs, and um, this. this what, so, what's your favourite bug? Favourite bug. But bees are bees are good. Bees are amazing. So many reasons. He loves bees. I, I, I do bees. like bees. I, I'm oh, totally into bees. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't even really like honey much. I was just into bugs. I just liked and just seeing inside. So I don't know when I caught the bug of the bugs. Um, but I got I think as even as a birthday present, I got, you know, a course with my local bee club. Are, club. are you a member of the BBKA? I am a member of the BBKA. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And that wasn't in my intro. No. no. The British <laughs> Beekeepers Association formed in 1874, older than the British and the American Orthopedic Association. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So this again, it goes. You know, there's that huge history of of human interaction with these creatures. But like, it's that thing like sharks. They've not changed for billions of years. They are perfectly adapted to doing what they do, which is going away, feasting on nectar and pollen in a flower, bringing it back to the hive. Vomiting it into their friend's face, vomiting it on again into another friend's face. It's like ragweed. And then over. storing <laughs> it all together. Yeah. So, how much do they eat at the sea? Like, do they actually consume themselves? I guess just enough to live and all the rest goes back to the hive. Yeah, so wow, I don't know if anyone's measured what. So, I don't think they feast on the, on the nectar because the water content is high. So, they bring the nectar, as I understand it, they bring the nectar back and then that's the, evaporated. So, they all vomit it up, add some enzymes in put it into one of those little um, honeycombs. Yeah. And then they have someone who will fan that and evaporate it, someone, a, a, a bee. Right, to, yeah. yeah. To, to yeah. fan it, evaporate off the water, concentrate it. And you've got honey from Egyptian times, that's right. uh, old Egyptian times. Yeah. Ancient Egypt, but which is still entirely edible. So it's... Or like four and a half thousand years it, ago. Exactly. So this is kind of, it's the ultimate food source and energy source because it is antibiotic. It is hyperosmotic. Well, we're using it now in wounds, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, I yeah. saw it yeah, yeah, yeah. described the other day, uh, honey dressing. Honey dressing. Again, <laughs> but I don't know with this fad of manuka again. You know, there are so many things that you go, there's, there's obviously something in it, but what different chemicals are in that manuka honey as opposed to the stuff I make in the back garden? Just wherever. So you eat your own honey? Yeah, 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 and not harvest how, it. And... How many bees do you have? So, I ha well, it's sort of cut, so the populations at the minute are quite low. I've got three hives, probably have about 5,000 or so bees in them. So they don't hibernate, they huddle, they all rub together, the queen in the middle to keep them warm, and they take turns on the outside, moving around and using the honey. So like penguins, have. kind of. A bit like that penguin thing, Ex yeah. exactly. So that they'll, you know, share as a colony exactly who's getting cold and who's getting warm. Yeah. And then at this time of year, the queen started laying, so there'll be brood babies starting to grow. Yeah. And then at the height of the um, summer, there's, you know, 200,000 bees wow. within each colony. And should we do some nerves? Let's do some nerves. Okay. We're moving on to nerves yeah, now. Good. <laughs> Why we're here. So Pete always gets his Why job. did you choose Pete? Like P and I, peripheral nerve injury uh, injuries, 
why would you choose that as a career? Well, I mean, I guess it's something you drift yeah. into. You didn't start off thinking that, but you're, you're an orthopedic trainee. At what you're point sawing was stuff, it? you're drilling stuff, yeah. you're cutting stuff, and then you go, and actually, you, I'm not going to do uh, that. To hell with that. I love the fixing. I don't like bones. Yeah, I love the fixing. Uh, I never enjoyed arthroplasty. That's oh, cement. my God, it's so boring. I just couldn't. Uh, yeah. I was nothing. It. it was metronomic, and there was, you know, yeah. So there was bits where I was just thinking, this really isn't, and then... You know, but yours, yours was because you didn't enjoy it. Pete was because you know he couldn't do it. Was couldn't do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. don't but, do that. With I you. mean, why do we do no, that? But, but hip and knee, <laughs> yeah. hip and knee replacement have some of the highest you know improvements in quality of life of any metric. Yeah, and I'm, really, we do. I, yeah. I'm really glad you guys do it. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to need some. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it was. I love the diagnosis side of things, and I think that was what. So in truth, what made me do P and I? I think it was Rolf, Rolf Birch, who was. Um, Prof in the in the nerve units. Um, one of them when I was a junior doctor, um, and I cross covered at Stanmore with the ward rounds, and it was just it just it was cool. It was the way he taught it, the way he enthused me. That it was it was sort of it was his Sherlock Holmes approach to diagnosis. It was all just methodical, and ev every piece of evidence yeah. was pulled in. And, and sometimes the lesion is the lateral contribution yeah. to the and, median nerve, yeah. and, and you go. Yeah, and and you've Take had me ten yeah. steps to catch up with you, but I'm finally yeah. there. And, he, and you, you, have, you have cheese and wine parties after yeah. theatres and stuff yeah. after and Rolf after the like, oh. yeah, Rolf, you know, you lateral, you know, lateral cutaneous nerve, and you've had eggs for breakfast. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, and are there any particular bits of P and I? So the paediatric yeah. stuff I've always enjoyed. So I, you know, I, I, having not enjoyed arthroplasty, I thought well, paediatric orthopedics must be where I want to be, and I didn't like the hip, and I didn't like the foot and ankle and there wasn't anything left of peds just yeah. supercondylist so that's just, it just, <laughs> just, <laughs> just, <laughs> I said that's peds covered guys right? paediatric <laughs> upper limb and everyone said but there is no such thing as paediatric yeah. limb there's just none of that I was like oh, okay <laughs> so um, yeah so um, so the peds nerve stuff's great because for some reason we're still not entirely sure if you as an adult get a nerve injury the overriding symptom that people tell you about number one two three and four on their hierarchy of symptoms are pain now kids don't have that kids have dysfunction and they have weakness but they don't get that neuropathic pain and it's we are so bad at treating it it is so debilitating that it really takes the gloss off enjoying seeing return of function and they go yeah it's amazing i can do this but i still don't use my hand because it still stings and burns like hell so with the kids you can get such great the distances for regrowth are much less nerve a, a degenerate nerve injury has to regrow so, so they recover quicker so they recover quicker so they can get better quicker but do kids nerves grow faster than, than adults so we don't know what speed nerves grow at we've always said this one millimeter a day and yeah i've got that locked yeah. in we've yeah. all got it locked fingernails in. Just, right yeah. yeah exactly in tectonic plates so, <laughs> um, so there's this universal growth rate of everything <laughs> it's in like, the world it's like it's bamboo, six weeks bamboo yeah. just <laughs> it blows that out of water head, a japanese knotweed japanese knotweed um <laughs> but yeah so <laughs> yeah this was <laughs> um so we don't know because we've never really seen it in humans. We've seen it in animals and we can control that and we can do that, but we've not done an experiment where we can definitely see that regrowth. And again, with my collaborations at UCL, there's a number of plans that we have towards that. So do they, do different nerves grow at different rates? So do sensory nerves, large nerves, myelinated nerves, do they grow at different rates? Um, do paediatric nerves grow quicker than adult nerves? You would think so, probably they are better at creating protein and everything right? and, and everything but and, and and anecdotally do you do you see that do you feel like the tenel moves faster or do you think it just moves a bit more predictably well again it's a bit like you see what you look for and i think we are so that is such a brilliant sign this tenel sign so the tapping to localize the growth cone to show where that is but that area is quite diffuse and you think about yeah. applying that kinetic e energy and that cone that's going to come down from the skin downwards how well can we localize exactly where that yeah. is? And do we just go, well, it was six weeks since I last saw them. It'll be about here. Oh, it's about there. And yeah. are people different? And is it better? Certainly lower limb seems to be less good, but then there's more muscle around. You, you can't percuss as easily. Yeah. So, you know, in truth, we just don't know. But probably kids' nerves do regenerate and the quality of regeneration is better. But the key thing is their brains are better and more plastic. So when we do these nerve transfers, so I take a nerve that um, is doing wrist flexion, and I wire it to do elbow flexion. If you did that to someone with a head injury who's in their 60s, they're going to struggle. Every time they want to bend their elbow, they've got to think bend the wrist, and that's not much use if you're always doing this. 
But kids, they don't even have to relearn it. They just use it. The brain is so constantly checking and working out. They'll just go, yeah, great. I'm, there you go. I'm doing it. But yeah. At the other extreme of your job, um, of what you do, the strange thing must be that a lot of it is I actually don't know. Mm. Um, and that, you know, how do you remain non-judgmental? Because there must be names you see again, and you, and you must feel like, oh, face, you know. Uh, <laughs> Another not, wrist drop. Not again. Again. Seriously? Seriously? You know? So the key. Can the, you name, firstly, can you name, name, can you name the worst offenders? <laughs> name names. Let me put this rider on it, on, on it first. It is great when you get somebody who says, we've done this injury. It was yesterday. It was this week. Can you help us out? And so accidents are going to happen and nerve injuries occur most of the time, not due to surgeon misadventure, but due to aberrant anatomy. But someone that's done a hip replacement the same way a thousand times and they get a foot drop. It's not because they've done anything differently. It's that there was a vessel growing through that nerve that tethered it, or there was an aberrant muscle, or you know there was a schwannoma there, whatever. So I think I like the fact that I get, you look at the referral patterns that you get, and it's because people know you, it's because people have heard you speak, and it's because you've gone and you've helped people out with their patients. And so you then get this channel of work where they've got, they're kind of switched on, they've got the antibodies to nerve injury, you see that they're following up their patients and that they're open to airing their dirty washing for their patients' benefit. So I think always ecstatic to say, let's have a conversation about what's right for that patient. And I'm scared about the people who've never, ever sent me a nerve injury yeah. because they've had them. They've had them, yeah. 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 Understood. But you, it's almost like you're the pathologist. You know? You're kind of like the confession for all the surgeons in the region. So there is, there is a big part of the job that's the late night call when they go, Tom, look, I've done this, and I just, I feel, and you just, and I just have that conversation. I just say, look, you do the work, you're gonna get the complications. You're a good doctor. You found your complication and you've been honest. You've said, yeah. help me out. Uh, so you're looking, the good doctor, you're yeah. not the bad doctor. Yeah. Are you looking at, is he looking at me or you? <laughs> <laughs> He's kind of looking at his mug there. Yeah. <laughs> um, the aim of this uh, podcast is to, for us to talk about everything your average orthopedic surgeon needs to know about nerves. Yeah accepting that we're all above average. Um, but for the purposes of this uh, podcast, just talk to us like we're idiots, okay? okay just yeah. use your imagination. Okay. Imagine someone who's significantly below average. <laughs> so if we start off with the functions of a nerve, we know that they control MTSP. Yep. You told us on the webinar, motor touch, sympathetics, and pain. And they don't like to be stretched, squashed. He's been, he was practicing mm. that oh, no, all he's morning. Like, he's like all down. morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, he's got a little mnemonic going on. Yeah, and nerve, and nerve badness can manifest in many, many ways. Um, can we start off with um, Seddon's classification? Do you mind just talking us through that? So, the folks at home. Seddon's, so all of the, from the very beginning, even back, 100, 100 odd years ago, we recognized that there was this amazing capacity of the nervous system to regrow. And we don't have that in many other tissues. Most tissues deal with scar. You cut the skin, you scar. You very rarely grow new skin. Bones are a very good example. We can reheal with bone that we models, but so many tissues don't. Now, we're not that great. We're not like a lizard. We can't regrow a whole limb, but people recognize that nerve was regenerating. And it was war generally that, that allowed us to study these things. So there's these, these huge jumps in the big European wars where people have... Yeah, it goes exactly back to one of our first podcasts. Remember I said war, what is it good for? Mm. Absolutely yeah. quite a no, lot. Nerve injuries. Nerve injuries. Nerve injuries. <laughs> and so much, yeah. yeah. So with the American Civil War, Silas Weir was one of their big war surgeons, uh, Napoleonic Wars, World War One, World War Two. here, plastics, reconstruction, face and nerve were the big things. Back in days. Exactly. Yeah. So people recognize that there were some nerves that got better and some nerves that didn't. Now, the basic principle of nerve is it can either be anatomically broken or anatomically intact, but physiologically broken. Okay, and I use the analogy of um, those cartoons of Roadrunner. Yeah, so Roadrunner gives Wile E. Coyote the bomb. Yeah. So he's holding the bomb. It's well, got it's a big acme fuse. on the side, doesn't it? The yeah. acme bomb. Yeah. yeah. What is acme? Is that, is that like Amazon? It's a fictitious Just company that the, made everything. The Warner Brothers use. Okay. Okay. It's not important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Amazon acme bomb. Yeah. And that's going to be Amazon. Bezos will be after us, and we can't afford that. <laughs> acme. Yeah. Um, so that bombs the muscle, and the fuse is the nerve. Okay. okay. Yeah? yeah. So yeah, the fuse is going to control the nerve. Yeah. Now, if that nerve the fuse gets wet, it's anatomically intact, it's there, it's just not working. That fire goes out and Wiley Coyote smiles to the camera and then the 
Anvil so, hits him on the head and, you know, all me, me, the bombs he runs away. Yeah. So it's anatomically intact, but it's not working. It's not working. That's it's a like, block. Which is just like Pete um, after a few points on it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's anatomically intact, darling. Just yeah. to reassure you on that front. Yeah. I've just, I've it just doesn't new, make any difference. I've just got neuropraxia. Yeah. yeah, so then there's this this word, <laughs> neuropraxia. Yeah, that, Neuro. Yeah, God. Ne- neuropraxia, no, right? please. I, we, we were going to get to this. It just makes me... So, so sometimes I find myself like after, a, you know, well, even not after a few pints, correcting people on their grammar. Like, yeah. so people say, uh, "Me and me and so and so went and did this thing." I said, "It was actually so and so." Always and I. that one. You do that to me. Yeah, yeah all I, the time. I know, but but just little grammatical checks, and you can't help yeah. help yourself but correct people. Is it like that for yeah. neuropraxia? Yeah, I, I and I I remember presenting in front of role for making that mistake myself oh. and, they, and just <laughs> oh I've done the wrong I did the thing I just don't. so I see why people do it because it's neuro you know it's neuro we do neuro things neurology and then, yeah but yeah but it's it's neuro as, as, as the stem yeah. and then apraxia not working a being the and do you say yeah. neuro or do you say neuropraxia neuropraxia yeah you a, a really yeah. to emphasize yeah. as, yeah. as, you, as you speed up yeah. you just turn okay, it to no. neuro so that's it? your Sunderland type one Yes. As well, but obviously you like Selling because he's a Stanmore man. Well, so all of this, yeah, so we've jumped around a bit, but yeah. the, yeah, so that conduction block. I'm afraid we do that. Yeah. We're, <laughs> not gonna gonna you, we're, we're not going to let you finish your train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Keep prodding and moving. Yeah. So, yeah, so the conduction block, I think, is a better, it's, it's English, we know what it means. The yeah. conduction is blocked. So, like Pete, in, in the morning after the hangover, he's going to be a Pete and he's going to be working physiologically. Yeah. You don't have to grow a new Pete. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas a degenerative nerve injury is chopping the head off Pete and then waiting for the rest of Pete to regrow from the neck. Because yeah. that's going to take a long time. Right. So, you, so don't grow, use, yeah, you don't grow a new head, do you? You grow, have to grow a new body. And you've got to grow. So this is why I use the worm. So, you know, you say you're out, you know, my gardener's out, you know, tending to the garden. He comes in and says, oh, Tom, I've, I've cut a worm in two. I yeah. go, well, that's fine. You know, I'm going to get two baby worms. He, he looks at me. That's not yeah. the way baby worms are made. Okay. <laughs> they're hermaphroditic and there's, and there's videos oh, I don't YouTube. know how they're made I'll have to google this later yeah, they rub well, up against will. each other yeah, don't there's they? a lot of goo yeah, there's a there? lot of yeah nice. they, kind of, they kind of slide next Spiraling. to each other and there's like, like, like yeah. squirming okay, yeah. then, um, so anyway so on, that's not on. how baby worms are made if you cut a worm in two how ba- is that how baby baits are made <laughs> isn't it there is squirming there is squirming <laughs> definitely a lot of squirming. Yeah. squirming particularly if you're watching it's like oh I don't I don't know about the goo so sorry Tom we were that's off putting Teach, oh. teach someone about nerves while we're talking about Pete's goo. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, where was I? Um, so, you cut a worm in two. Cut a worm in two. One bit's going to live, the bit with the head, because that can create protein, that can bring stuff in and regrow. The tail been disconnected from its ability to create protein, so that's going to necrose and die, and that is Wallerian degeneration. So the cell body bit that's got all the you know, ability to make protein and pump that down and have the building box to continue to build a nerve will stay alive, the distal bit will die. Okay. Although, you take and cut a nerve really close to the cell body, it has a sort of calculation. It's got, look, I've got two meters now to regrow. I'm never going to make it. Yeah, forget it. I'm going to just... I'm I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. Yeah. Yeah. So so the more proximal the injury, which is why the brachial plexus injuries are so challenging, is you're going to get greater cell death. Right. Right. And there's nothing to fight that. Well... There should be. So we should have chemicals to be able to control this. But again, it's it's at what point do you have to get in there before that apoptotic cycle starts? But that is, again, uh, that's going to be a focus of future work to say, look, let's arrest the second hit from this injury. Um, and again, it's that. So when people go in and get back to the pediatric injury again, you get a birth injury in childhood. So your brachial plexus is stretched. All those, all those nerves have, have died. If you can avoid having to go in and cut it again and give a second hit and again even more proximal and give another 10% loss of those mm. axons, you're going to be in a better place. You've got more connections to the brain, to the limb to deal with. Yeah. And so it's, it's, I think there are so many problems that we don't have an answer to, but we're starting to understand exactly why they why they're a Now, just explain to me what happens to the bit that degenerates. Yeah. So, so I presume the, 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 the cell dies, and when you look at the diagrams, it kind of goes a bit flaky yeah. and a bit, bit like, bleh, bleh, yeah. bit nondescript. What actually happens? So that's the, so it's an active process. So this doesn't happen in, for example, in an ischemic limb. So that's one of the problems where when you've got loss of blood supply, you're not going to get this Wallerian degeneration. It takes an active process. So 
you have a breakdown, the axoplasm breaks down, it creates debris, and that stimulates an inflammatory response, and that gets cleared up. So the macrophages come in, and they just see dead tissue. So they're going to die. But what doesn't happen, all the basement membrane is left, so the, so the train tracks are left, and the Schwann cells, the Schwann cells don't just myelinate, there's myelinating Schwann cells that allow our saltage reconduction. Mm -hmm. But there's also, like any nerve, has its glial cells. So in the, in, in, in the brain, the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, each nerve has a supportive Schwann cell. Now, in the non-myelinating ones, they pair up with lots of nerves. The myelinating ones have a one-to-one -one relationship. They only wrap around one nerve. But all of these Schwann cells have lost, therefore, their axon. So they all pine for the axon, digest any of the myelin that they had as energy, and then go, we must find axons again, so pump out chemicals to attract okay. nerves to grow down that train track. So they're like the signaling lights along yeah. the train track to say, come on yeah, through, come the on. track's open. Okay, so all the macrophages have cleared the track. Right, so when, when, the, when the new nerves are coming down, new, new, the, the, the new cone is coming yeah. down, it's got something to gun for. It's got the basement membrane on which to grow. So that's the pseudopodia, the sort of the amoeboid actions searching out where to go. And it's being attracted by those... Schwann cells, cells are here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So is they, they are being yeah. coaxed because I had the impression that they were growing down. Uh, they came off. They came off the the injured nerve, and then they were they're all going all all manner of directions, and some were just lucky enough to find yeah. their way down, yeah. and they and they just accidentally almost like, went down. So that's about that nerve gap. So if you get a crush without a loss of continuity of the of the external layer of the nerve, they can't escape. They're all going to go down places. But again, you've got some nerves that are sensory nerves that are trying to find an end organ, and then motor nerves that are bringing acetylcholine and are pointless if they connect to a sensory that's end true, organ. Yeah. So is that they've true? Got to go down the right one. Is the, is and that's. Is that true? If if so a if motor if, nerve can't, so it's connected to the motor. Well, it's not connected directly, but it's yeah. connected. It's proximal wiring is to the motor cortex. Of course, yeah. And its job is drop the acetylcholine that yeah. we've made and we've transported down within yeah, you. Yeah. So that's no use connecting to a Golgi organ or a, yeah, yeah. you know. Do you accept that now? No, I, like, is that true? Is that true? Are you lying? Is that what you're getting? Muscles, had, you, had you heard different? No, one of the things I heard you say the other day was that um, muscles without the, that are de-innovated, mm. that have no innovation whatsoever, yeah. uh, slowly atrophy over yeah. time. And we know that muscles have sensory as well as motor inputs because yeah. they've obviously got they've got the motor bit which makes them contract. They've yeah. got a sensory bit which which is like all the stretch receptors, etc. Mm. So my I guess my question is if they get the sensory bit back, yeah. but not so much the motor, or the motor comes a bit later, let's say, does the sensory bit help them stay active and alive? So we don't yet know, but this is absolutely. Is there anything you do know? <laughs> <laughs> He knows about bees. <laughs> bees and switch. So we have started the height of my non-professional knowledge. We have <laughs> now exposing my professional lack yeah. of knowledge. Yeah. The knowledge of bees yeah. was the encyclopedia. The encyclopedia, there's the whole lot. Royal anyway. jelly and all well, that Well, listen, stuff. thanks for coming, Tom. Have That's you? the end of today. <laughs> <laughs> you think of in injuries as being conduction blocks or degenerative, don't you? Yeah. And, and how do you split up the degenerative side of that? So that's this, again... We haven't moved forward in 100 years, so we've still got this Tinell sign, Tinell Hoffman sign. Thank um, you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the tapping on the skin allows us to identify where the growth cone is. Now, if that growth cone is going nowhere over serial examinations over time, then it's not going to. So that nerve growth cone wants to find some train tracks and some signals to go somewhere. And if it's doing that, I can't speed it up. We have no ability, no, there is no drug for nerve no magic fairy dust. There is, no, no, but it's it's like a heart cells. attack in the 1950s. You were told unless your ventricles blown apart, you're in you're on bed rest and you get what you get. That's nerve injury. Unless you've really badly torn things apart, right. there's nothing I can do as a surgeon, and there's no drug we have. You know, and now heart attacks is clever drugs apparently yeah, for treating yeah. that. We don't have that clever drug. So it is, we treat the real tip of the iceberg of nerve injury with laying down some extra tracks. That's really all I do is take some nerve and lay in a track or rewire things. But there's no ability to do any more. So in answer to your question, to get back to our degenerative, you have a favorable prognosis where it's going to get better. And you can predict the future. You can say, look, last time I saw you six weeks ago, this was an inch further along. This is going to re-innovate. You know, your median nerve is going to be innovate. Your pronator next. 
and then your FCR. So you're, so you're pointing at your forearm for everyone who's listening. The, are you then taking? We got, the, we got, we got cameras. Yeah, but there's some people are. Oh, okay, okay. But um, <laughs> no, and you're you're welcome to point. Don't get me wrong. I'm just <laughs> pointing out for the folks at home. <laughs> it's like this is like test match special. Um, <laughs> I'm not touching. Yeah, yeah. 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 But um, Barbara what, Wallace has sent us in a rather fine you, pork yeah. pie to share. <laughs> Hello, Agus. Uh, and blowers, wasn't it? Yeah, are you measuring it from like which? What's your fixed point there? That yeah. So I think I'm BNI. Yeah, I think wherever a fixed point is that that is going to stay closed. So you could take it from the antecubital crease. Okay. You could take it from the medial epicondyle. I just think you you've got There's a reference. There's no set points there. No, I just think you've got a reference. Well. How am I going to refine this next time? You could you know take a tattoo pen and you know ink them up and yeah. say oh your next spot and here we go. It's like a sort of What's that experiment in physics with the ticker tape thing? Drop no, it's just me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so you could you know you could permanently mark. The but there's the, there's but the advancing tunnel, but there's also the advancing motor innovation, mo exactly. motor so response. Goes, just like our train, you've got the tube line that's going to go off at each station. You go mm -hmm. a median nerve at the elbow will re-innovate first to teres, and then as it advances, it gets to FCR and then yeah. Palmaris, and then you oh. know all of those other yeah. forearm, yeah. you know, the abduct policies. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> loaf. Yeah. So yeah, so I remember what loaf stands for, but I remember loaf. <laughs> so the um, so the difference is, if it is advancing, it's going to continue advancing, and you can predict the future. And that so your patient then goes favorable prognosis. prognosis, and the patient goes, "Doctor, you said next time it would do this, and it did it. Pretty much the week you said it was going to do it. You're, yeah, like, yes, I I know. I was <laughs> predictable. But if but if every time you see them, the tunnel sign is stationary, that means that process of regeneration has failed. So it's creating a neuroma. So the nerve axons have done what you said. They've gone crazy oh. everywhere without direction. And there's that gray area between the two where some have gone down, as you say, just by accident happen to go and then find a train track. And then you'll get this split tunnel with a stationary bit and an advanced one. And the question that you ask then is, which is louder? And people seem to understand that, that question. So when I tap here, the advanced bit and the stationary bit, which is the louder of the two tunnels? And you can essentially then weigh up, have most of the axons given up and gone wrong, yeah. or are most the axons on this journey, this caravan towards going where they're going? And as it's advancing, mm. if, it, if it's advanced from, say, the antecubital fossa down to halfway down the forearm, do you expect it to get all the way, or could it stop at any point? Yeah, so again, this is the question of whether further compression lower down. So some of my colleagues will say, oh, there's an injury here, I'll sort of clear the way for it, I'll do a decompression of the carpal tunnel speculatively. But unless there's been an injury there, that's normal nerve. It's clear track. Nice. So again, you could watch it and you can see, and that's why I'd use neurophysiology. I'd say I was expecting this by this point to have re-innovated. Has it? Because occasionally the nerves get there, but the brain doesn't think to send the signal down. So the muscle is re-innovated, but it's yeah. not functional. But, it, but there are times where it may not, it may, it may stop short. No, so I don't think it does. That's it what does. I mean. Okay. I think that, that okay. would be the abnormal state. Right. And I'd have okay. to question why and understand what it so if I was going to injure one of your nerves, I'm going, to, I'm going to injure your radial nerve, how would you have me injure it? Would you have me cut it in half, like with, cleanly with a knife? Would you have me crush it to death? Or would you have me like stretch it, stretch it out? So I think uh, what you don't want is to get pain. So I think the key thing is a non-compound. So, so to injure the nerve itself rather than all the rest of the tissues around it. So if you have an open fracture, skin loss, ischemia, you are a lot more likely to get a process of neuropathic so I think the lower energy injury is always the best. And of course, you'd want the lesser injury. So you'd want something with continuity. So you, you'd want a degenerative in injury that's in continuity, which is a favorable degenerative. Yeah. So, so probably a squash. A squash is quite good. Just a Saturday night palsy. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Okay. You wanted to ask about Saturday night palsy, didn't you? Yeah. I, well, I was, I was going to talk about conduction block, but we'll get there in just a second. All but, yours, all so yours. you go for a crush. Uh, because it's in continuity, a, yeah, a, gen, a gentle, gentle crush, but gentle not crush. a crush over a long, uh, over no, a long exactly. segment. Exactly, and not with muscle necrosis and not with skin loss. Right, and just putting words in your mouth, do you perceive that the high energy thing is partly, and the, and the pain and yeah. the non-advancing tunnel is because you get localized scarring, which yeah. kind of interrupts that that motorway yeah. as you're so going down. So there's the extra neural scar, and you can think of that nerve as a compartment within itself so if you get scar within there and that then you know contractile like you see the the burn scars pull in same kind of thing you get in you see the sheets of hematoma where sort of it's all scars been laid down and it's all tight you release that off and you see the nerve jump up from there so it was under tension and you see all the veins fill all those venules around it fill so it's had a pressure greater than venous pressure 
So just like doing a fasciotomy. Just like doing a fasciotomy. So that yeah. nerve can then power up. So the reason, we can go right back to what a nerve is, it's that action potential. To have an action potential, you need a resting potential. And that's created by an active process. Again, ATPase that pumps sodium and potassium. So without the oxygen, without the ATP, you don't have a resting potential. So that's the, the lowest form of conduction block is an ischemic conduction block where you've lost the oxygen and so your little fan that's constantly keeping it all going stops. Yeah. You don't have resting potential. And that's why a, would that give you pain? So that's not going to give you pain no. necessarily. The, so there's a, well, so it's chemical and physical reasons. So you put a nerve in a squashed environment, it is going to cry out in pain for a number of reasons. You are damaging tissue. So that squash is damaging tissue. It's creating potassium. It's creating all those other, you know, um, noxious compounds. You put it in ischemic area, it's, it's just doing the same. And if it's tethered, it's getting stretched, it's getting strained. And so mechanical and chemical problems are the reasons why you get that, you know, nerve crying out, that neurostenalgia of, yeah. of pain. And that often creates allodynia. So the nerve's in continuity, so signals are moving. And allodynia means light touch creating pain. So you know the nerve's in continuity because I touch the finger and you feel it. But you're feeling light touch as pain. So that is the signal being mismanaged at that site of injury. Release the scar, that allodynia goes away. When Hercules fought the Hydra, yeah. as you know, mm. he chopped off like one of its heads and it's he- interview by Boris Johnson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as you know. Yeah. No, no, no. In, in the lake, in the lair, in the lake of Lerner. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. so you've chopped the he head chopped the head off the, head head off yeah. the hydra, yes. like the, the eight, it might be twelve headed hydra. Anyway, every time he chopped the head off, it would grow Ooh, two group. back. No, yes. two back. Two ba- okay. So yeah. it's like, oh my god! Yeah. And every time he like he thought he was winning, like it would get he did double trouble. Mm. When you take an individual nerve cell, yeah. not a nerve, like a yeah. ne- nerve neuron. cell neuron, yeah. and you chop its head off, so you yes. injure it directly with mm. a cut. Five on average. Five. Oh. On average. Yeah. Five headed hydra. I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and, okay, and so each causes, of those is, is, is... Yeah, so this causes chaos. So your question about how muscles work and all that re function and sensory things. Muscle primarily is a proprioceptive organ. So you look at a pure motor nerve, what percentage of those nerves are the afferents, those coming back it, within that nerve? About 70 or 80%. So wow. Then, there's more information coming back from a muscle than there is going to it. The efferent function, that going, is the alpha motor neuron, which does the work, but it's also the gamma motor neuron that's setting the tension of those, you know, the sensory function of, of nerve. So proprioceptive, but also interaction of the agonist and the antagonist, and prepositioning and pretensioning of when you're going to apply that force. And that's all incredibly complicated at a spinal level and a brain level, but muscle primarily does that. So you cut a nerve, you more damage all those sensory nerves by a percentage number right. yeah. than you do the efferent function. So all those coordination functions. All go. And, they, and then rewiring it, it all goes absolutely crazy. And if you injure it proximally, you get some nerves that were supposed to go to biceps to elbow flex, get lost, take a wrong turn up at Albuquerque <clears throat> with acme and end up in triceps. So you get the brain going bend the elbow and actually you get the co-contraction, you get the biceps and triceps going together. So you get this dysfunction. Yeah. And patients say it fatigues. So we've shown that it fatigues more and quicker. Uh, they say that it doesn't feel right. It's just not that real ownership of, you know, I'm not feeling like it's a biceps. It's doing the job of biceps, but it's not my muscle. And it, and, and it doesn't have that great ability of force, that recruitment of muscle. You, you know, with your hand, you do delicate <clears throat> and really powerful. When you recruit those, when you put more signal down in, into the nerve, you get bigger and bigger motor pools. That doesn't re-establish after nerve injury. So you don't get that lovely, you know, first gear, second gear, third gear, up. You get off or on. Right. Yeah, so patients hate that. And it, and it fatigues on both um, sustained and repeated contraction. It can't hold that for as long. And so if I was to chop someone's radial nerve in, in half yeah. and, then, and then immaculately repair it, so, but, yes. they, but it's still, it's got, all got to grow down and there yeah. will be a bit of mix up and there's yeah. some junction box problems, mm-hmm. you know, afferent go to efferent, et cetera. What's the very, very, very best you could expect of that, of that nerve repair? So the radial nerve is a good example because it's quite a blunt function, radial nerve. You don't need a huge amount of power. 
It's a bit like the alligator mouth, you know, it's much weaker opening than it is pushing down. Yeah. You know, right. you, you, you've only got to lift fingernails against, against gravity, whereas all of this is a lot more greater built. So radial nerve, the functional outcomes are really good because it's a pretty basic function. But you do that to an ulnar nerve or a median nerve, and yeah, it's, you will never get near normal on a subjective assessment. We would look with MRC grade and go, well, that's good power. There's a good grip. There might be a slight difference in hand grip. But, but they're, they're never going to love they're, it. They're never going to love it because it doesn't feel right. It just won't coordinate. It's not normal. It's just all over, not like it was before. Right. And I don't think you will ever, with a degenerative nerve injury, get normality. Because we, we often think about, uh, and this is this is goes back to what you're saying in the in the webinar about uh, us grading nerve recovery as MRC grade. Well, mm -hmm. look look, they've got great power. They can abduct their fingers. Yeah. They can make a yeah. fist. They can extend their wrist. Success, yay! Mm -hmm. Discharge from clinic. Yeah. But actually, the, the the patient doesn't actually feel that. Yeah, a lot yeah. more nuance. We'll always be. Yeah, brilliant. Listen, we're going to move on to. Yeah. Can I just ask you about conduction block just very yeah. quickly because I, I've never really got that. So conduction block. What's happening in conduction? So if I if I if I sat on your hand and yep. it goes and it goes numb, or sat on your arm or whatever, yep. and it goes your arm goes numb, why does it go numb? So the the first process probably is going to be that ischemic injury. So you're sat at stool on the toilet and your leg goes numb. That's, That's happened pretty damn quickly. Happens, I yeah. don't know how long. How about long half an hour you. for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about half an hour. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just, you know, it depends on the reading material, but uh, yeah, I'm, fami I'm so, familiar. The first thing is that numbness. Now that happens probably because of, as we've said, this, this ischemic conduction block. So pressure is creating an area where blood can't get in, you're developing is hypoxia. It ischemic of the nerve or ischemic, uh, ischemia of the Schwann cell? It's, yeah, so the Schwann cell's fine. So the Schwann cell has very little activity to do, but that axon has to maintain a resting position. It's constantly buzzing away, yeah. using yeah. energy. To so he, the, it's the neur neuron that is the metabolically yeah. active creature. Exactly. So the lack of yeah. blood supply means you lose a resting place. Exactly. So you then can't conduct. So you don't get the information backwards and forwards. Right. Now, when it comes back, you're walking around, you, you know, you're leaving the toilet. Yeah. You and get you, that. You take a step and you're like, oh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, that, <laughs> head the sink. so that is that is your loss of proprioception. You don't know where that leg is. Ah. Yeah. So yeah. you... You might have a motor palsy, but equally you might. No, it depends. You know, it depends how long yeah, you've, how been, bad you've been, been set. But even if you don't have the motor palsy, you don't have the proprioceptive. You don't know where that leg is. You know you can't trust it. It's yeah, not yeah. right. You can't feel it. Yeah. You're not getting the skin yeah. sensation, but you're not getting the joint yeah. sensation. It takes a couple of steps. It does. And, and then too. comes the pain. Yeah. So this is then that that revascularization. Everything's firing off. They're all going, whoa, I've got oxygen again. And it's all firing off and sending those horrible tingling paresthetic yeah. dysthetic feelings to you until it settles down again but there's no permanent injuries that goes back to normal i'm loving this tom it's all making sense now <laughs> literally it's all making sense <laughs> does there anything else you want to know but sometimes yeah. sometimes that conduction block doesn't it's not degenerative yeah. but the conduction block that takes 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 weeks and weeks and weeks right so there's single event conduction block Okay, so if you do something and then stop it, that will improve. So in Queen Square, they took, well, I'm not sure it was actually at Queen Square, but the group at Queen Square, I think it was in the 50s, took a baboon and put a tourniquet around, inflated it to 400 or whatever, and left it on for hours. Bastards. And that created a six-month conduction block. Okay, right. single event, did that, took it off, that way to fix it. And that's the, the Schwann cells there got pushed and invaginated and all sort of piled up, leaving this big naked part. And you've got those internodes... But without the capacitance of the Schwann cell, can't do that saltatory conduction. These are the nodes of Ronvier. That's exactly right. So that's where you've got all of those um, um, electron-gated channels. Yeah, yeah. electrically-gated channels. So they, without a Schwann cell between them, they can't jump. So you've pushed all the, sh all the Schwann cells out. They've actually got to migrate back to where they were. Okay. So that so they takes find six themselves months. Again. Okay. So there's these multiple layers from, from just the ischemia of the axon to physical changes where actually, you know, there's electron microscopy, these things all piled up underneath each other with this big naked part here with, you know, wanting to do conduction but just mm. not being able to. So single event conduction block can take up to six months, normally three, with a sort of normal injury, three, occasionally six. But then there can be persistent conduction block. And that is the scar that we were talking about. So if you have an injury, it bruises, it bleeds, it scars, and that scar contracts. 
that scar isn't going away. Well, uh, for so that conduction uh, block will yeah. be persistent until okay. you go and release as, that. Scar. Okay, as, but as it's if it still gets caught up in callus or something. Yeah, kind of yeah. Thing. Well, or in the bone or whatever. Yeah. But but that bone's going to destroy the nerve. This this scar mm. needn't cause any degenerative nerve injury. It doesn't necessarily need to create a tunnel, but it's it might cause pain and it will cause a dysfunction because it's it's persistently got it. blocking got the it. nerve. But it's non-degenerative. Yeah. But still, it's not getting any better. Exactly. But then it'll be from that point that I release it. Three da, months da, or da. six months, but it's then ah, got to have that got, process okay. of starting yeah. going. Right, okay, so you release it and then the Schwann cell's got to find that, find exactly. the, get their yeah, shit back the, together yeah. again before before yeah. you can have nice cell taste yeah. reconduction. Yep. Yeah. Got it. There you go, there's conduction block. Assessment of nerve injuries. Uh, it seems to me, like in many other sp- subspecialties, we've kind of moved on from clinical examination. Mm. Like in trauma, for example, we don't even bother. You know, if someone comes into the trauma bay, you don't even bother. CT. Like, I, I, you, you get a CT, you get some blood gases, you do some observations, but essentially you get a bunch of x-rays. You don't need really, to see the patient, you know. It's you quite can. nice to say hello I mean, in the it is, it, is, <laughs> it is nice to get a neurovascular status, uh, you know, in, uh, in advance, but actually people often forget that because yeah. they're so used to yeah. not having to examine the patient and not have to do any diagnostic skill. It seems to me like nerve injury, you kind of haven't really... No, we don't moved on. You haven't really moved but on. Even, but even cardiology has moved on. You don't... Yeah. The, now, instead of yeah. just yeah. go yeah. get an echo. Lub, lub, psh, psh, Yeah, or exactly. There's none of that. So, yeah, I think we are the last... I think neurology generally is, you know, and we, you know, we see the medical neurologists and they'll spend at a paediatric patient just the other day and I thought I had done a good examination and then the neurology ward, the paediatric neurology ward round comes down and that's half an hour plus 15 minutes taking pictures and... A full assessment. So yeah, no, it is. It's absolutely key, and I think that's that's the part that people don't get the history. Again, you know, people don't take the ample history anymore. It is just there's the trauma call and there's the X-rays and let's fix yeah. the fracture. So yeah, I think it is. It, it's about listening to that mechanism, listening to the symptoms, and the time of onset and the change is really key. So I think it's 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 right back to med school. It's not necessarily understanding what pets people have got, but it is history examination, and then the special tests. There there aren't many. You know, you can often have an MRI and not see the nerves on pretty much any of those slices. Yeah, because you know they're not big things, and everyone says you know, well we got an MRI of the brachial plexus. I was like, well, why? I'm going to look for hematoma or I'm going to look for tumor, but I'm not going to see a nerve injury on that scan because it's just not there. And again, we don't have functional imaging, so you can't see conduction block because it's anatomically intact. So an anatomic picture is not going to help you. And we yeah. don't yet have that physiologic, and we should be able to, because there's tiny little currents and little magnetic fields. So you would hope in time we'll be able to say, oh, look, there's that blue area. All the rest is green and working well, but there's this area here that's not happy. But so right now we're not there. We're so, not there. Yeah. So how do, we, how do we assess a nerve? Talk us through it. So history. So is this low energy? Is this high energy? So is this hit by a train? Is this motorbike, you know, horse, or is this slip and fall and shoulder dislocation? So that's really key. Like any trauma, mechanism is going to be related. Higher energy trauma, worse injury, worse outcome. This, you know, that's number It's one. directly proportional. Exactly. Um, you know, the kinetic energy dumped into you affects your nerves. And you see the x-ray, you see the bone in fragmented pieces. And that poor nerve, you, that, um, the picture that you see, you guys recognize it is not the maximal displacement that was way over here at one yeah. point in the x-ray it's all back here because it all looks arm shaped again but you think about these poor noodles that were in there because they've lost the anatomic continuity of that bone they were stretched to hell yeah so mechanism key then history so what happened when was it numb was it numb when you dislocated it and you were sat waiting for the ambulance was it numb in a and e after the you know propofol wore off when you got home because was it the primary trauma, which might be slightly high energy? Was it the reductions? Was it caught in the joint? Has it been, you know, someone's foot in the axilla? Because again, that's going to be different mechanisms and thus different outcomes. So if you have, to so the standard shoulder dislocation axillary nerve, the major determinant of outcome is going to be mechanism. So right. under, understanding when that happened, and that's hard with the axillary nerve, but with median ulnar and everything else, people know you know, radial nerve, oh, I had a wrist drop when I was on the side. I couldn't recognize it was numb here and I couldn't lift my fingers up. And they're quite clear. The auxiliary nerve is not, it's not as obvious, but the mechanism of injury is key. Okay. And then examination. 
Yeah, so then the examination is, and everyone will always tell me about the motor loss. They'll always say there's a wrist drop, there's a can't do drop. this, can't do that. Yeah, but they won't say all the other things. And to me, people want to give me an MRC grade. <laughs> if there's any even flicker of activity w within a muscle, that's fine. That's got a nerve to it because it's working. The brain yeah. can contract it. Whereas people will say, oh, sensation was intact. Well, I want to know more. That is what I'm interested in. What areas... And not to say this is C5 and this is C6, because if it's an infraclavicular injury, I'm not interested in the root level, I'm interested so in the peripheral nerves. I want to know it's the back of the thumb or the pulp of the index finger, where they've got light touch dysthesia, it feels unpleasant when it's touched, or paresthesia, it tingles when I touch it. So that, the very fact there's something tells me there's nerve incontinuity, and if there's allodynia, it tells me that there's an ongoing injury of nerve. What's and, the difference between dysesthesia yeah. and allodynia? So dysthesia is unpleasant, allodynic is painful. So it's this parasthetic is just tingly. Right. Dysthesia is unpleasant, allodynia breaking into pain. Right. And, and that's quite important because if you have that light touch allodynia, I want to be acting quickly. There's something really that's probably ongoing and worsening, deepening that nerve injury. Right. Okay. And sp so then neuropathic pain. So people tell me there's neuropathic pain. Well, where is it? In what distribution? Is it spontaneous? Does it happen just while they're sat there? Or is it evoked? Allodynia. So light touch. People always say, I can't have my foot under the under the bedclothes. That light, it's yeah. awful. That's something you yeah. hear, don't you? You do, you hear yeah. that an awful lot. Yeah. Now that's a really important sign. It tells you nerves are in continuity, mm. but there's something upsetting something those bad. nerves. Yeah. And what is causalgia? So causalgia is probably a again, it's I think it's used, it's one of those terms that are used in a in a a variety of different ways, but it's what most people think of as a CRPS type injury. So causalgia probably is a high, as the way I appreciate it, is a high energy injury that's created a vascular injury and a nerve injury together. And that creates that horrible sympathetic overdrive, severe pain, the door slams and they feel it, you know, yeah. the wind blows and they yeah. feel it. Now that again, with those high energy injuries with that is an absolute indication for intervention. So pain's really important for me because it's one of those things that I want to intervene on. So after a hip replacement, a foot drop, okay, you stretch the nerve, you know, there's probably, you've either really badly damaged it or it's gonna come back, but a foot drop with pain, a painful paralysis, let's get in and sort that out, because that's getting worse in front of our, our Something's eyes. Something's causing it. Something's that's causing it. So there's a circlage, you've got it under tension, you've got cement, and there's a fracture fragment, but a painful palsy is like a compartment. It's one of those things that you should not let go and, you know, I, I accept nowadays no one's going to explore it that night, but it needs to be fast-tracked because we can get rid of that pain in those patients pretty reliably, and that's horrible pain. And the quicker you get yeah. it, the better they do. Yeah, because they, because you're not having that ongoing process of worsening of that of that nerve injury. So, so listen, we will we'll come back to CRPS um, or pain stuff in a bit. Yeah. Um, but in terms of your assessment, is this where you talk about your MTSP? Might try something professional. Like yeah, said. so the motor, again, everybody does. Sympathetics, it is it is quite hard to look at and test and assess. Uh, it's really useful in kids. I think I might have mentioned this before, but you look at a digital, you have a kid with a laceration on a hand. Is that digital nerve intact or not? It's really hard. The kid's screaming, you know, they may not be vocalizing, telling you how it, how it feels and it all feels sore. But if you put a wet swab around that and occlusive dressing and come back in 20 minutes, if... If, if there's no nerves, that doesn't go wrinkly and pruney. Mm. Like when you're in the bath, your skin does that. Without a nerve, it doesn't do that. It's one of the right. sympathetic functions of nerve. So that's a useful assessment tool. But just looking in, people always talk, it's a bit like the needing a wall to look at serratus anterior. Yeah. People seem to I want to take a biro, yeah. and I, I don't know what it is about the biro and yeah. testing for sweat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say biro. I thought yeah. he was about yeah. to say, yeah. one of the things you do but is you, really, you take the biro, you must have the biro yeah. for sweating. But I find my fingers m much better at feeling sweating yeah. than yeah. a biro. Now, my mother used to tell me that when I've been in the bath for too long and my hands turned into what I thought I thought I was turning, first time happened to me, I thought I was turning into a witch. I really was convinced. Uh, how, how old were you when your mother stopped bathing you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I came running out of it. Mum, oh, okay, mum, look right, at my hands. Yeah. What's happened? Yeah. Are you telling me that's not to do a hydrostatic, you know, like, like, like or an osmotic it phenomenon? Yes, it's, yes. it's a sympathetic phenomenon. So it's, I think you need the sympathetics to allow the skin to be functioning to do that. So you can lose your fingerprints too. If you have nerve injury, 
fingerprints go completely smooth. So I don't know what the mechanism of, of that is in terms of how the sympathetics create the rugosity of the skin. And, and then you can't right. use touch ID. You can't use touch ID, but you're a really great cat burglar. You just can't yeah. feel. Just can't no touch. Just can't 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 Okay, so that's um, you get that when you with plaster as well. When you're putting using cement, when you're mixing cement and you don't yeah. wear gloves, it yeah. kind of eats your hands. You, you can't use Touch ID after that either. Okay, when have you mixed cement without gloves in theatre? Oh well, no, 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 not not bone cement, oh, like cement, 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 like, oh, okay. like plastering a wall, like uh, DIY. Okay. I'm thinking. Okay, sorry, my bad. You're rendering a patio, whatever. Yeah, yeah, as one <laughs> does, right? Yeah. Um, so, so you've, you've talked about motor. motor. Well, you touched a motor. Yeah, do, and we've touched do, on touch. Do you want an MRC grade? No, yeah. So the MRC system was designed for essentially recovery from polio. You know, so essentially for me, MRC basically goes kind of zero, three, or five. Yeah, and there's pluses and minuses. You can have three yeah. plus, three minus. Yeah. So th can move against light gravity. So I've taken them to the moon, and they're able yeah. to bend yeah. the elbow. <laughs> so gravity yeah. less is fine. You know, we've done yeah. the the plane dive with zero gravity and they can function perfectly well but yeah. bring gravity back at <laughs> yeah. full they're, they're, they're screwed yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah there's a lot of pluses and minuses and people and I just don't think it's universally well applied and it's not it's so uh, it's lovely that people try yeah. but I often get oh there's a bit of weakness and I'm like well that's just not me you know yeah. that's, that is not a nerve in injury yeah um, and but why is it relevant? Why is the sympathetic? People are thinking, why is the sympathetic? Th okay, okay, yeah. sure. Let's say the sympathetics aren't working. So okay, what? Why so is that relevant? Sympathetics are the smallest fibers. So in the majority of injuries that we get, the closed injuries, you get a a, a maintenance of those smaller fibers because they can simply get out the way. You crush a, a nerve, you're going to crush the big fibers that do feeling, the big fibers that do motor. The teeny tiny ones can kind of wiggle out the way. So it may be the only function left to tell you the nerves in continuity. So those are the most resi most resilient. Well, so they're just smaller. Well, so with the crush, a lot more to hurt them, right? Yeah. Well, they just they can move out of the way more easily. Yeah. So you squash a nerve down flat. All the big ones are going to get squashed. Oh, small ones are kind mercy, of, mercy! Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. They can sort of wiggle out the way. So, so right. looking for sympathetic function tells you. But like the dinosaurs you know, getting wiped out, but the, the little yeah. the little rodents and yeah. stuff, the little and mammals, again, they, they all survive. With conduction block, you often hit the bigger, more metabolically active nerves, and these smaller ones can get away on a sort of slightly strangled oxygen supply, and they don't get as compressed with compression. So it's very classic that if you have sympathetics maintained. You, it's not, you know, you know that this is a conduction block. So you, you're happier, you've got a nerve in continuity, and likely you're going to have a better outcome. Right. And if the sympathetics go, then you know it's a horrible You know you've got a horrible injury. Yeah, yeah. so you get this dry, and it, and it is quite rare, but you see it and it's marked. You've got dry, red skin. It just looks really weird. Like, what yeah. is going on? But yeah. you need a biro to But you it. must, yeah. You must, you must yeah, <laughs> fetch me a biro. <laughs> Yeah, but they're non-myelinated as well, aren't they? Is it got something to do? The, is, is it the Schwann? Because if you if you disrupt the Schwann cell as part of that yeah. crush, I, gu I guess the big the big fat guys that the motorways go down. Yeah, but the, the non-myelinated yeah. guys yeah. Uh, can, exactly. can, can. So also I think it's more of a function of size because that myelination is is related mainly to the larger fibers, and that just speeds them up. So again, we um, we might get to nerve conduction testing, or that might be another day, but. Nerve conduction testing looks at the top 5-10% of those fibers. It looks at the big, noisy, fast fibers. Never looks at the small fibers. Right, okay. So you can get, you know, people get nerve conduction studies to try and diagnose neuropathic pain. Yeah. Well, look, neuropathic pain is those small, tiny fibers. Right. So it can be entirely normal because you've looked at the 100 meters Olympic race and you've told me that Hussein Bolt's really quick and that the commentator's really noisy, but you haven't told me what the rest of the population watching that, what their time is over 100 meters. So it gives you a focus on some nerve fibres, but it so doesn't give you a report. So it's not useful for neuropathic pain. It isn't. You, it, you wouldn't get it because it's not a test that's going to give you the answer for that question. It's just, I think when a lot of people are treating nerve injuries, you get a bit desperate. You kind of go, nerve yeah, nerve let's get an MRI yeah. and yeah. let's get a nerve conduction. And, 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 and then we'll give Tom a ring. Yeah, and then <laughs> you then send me a report that you've not looked at. You've just gone, oh, there's a letter. Can you just forward that to someone yeah. who actually can yeah. look at those numbers? <laughs> yeah. The but do not examine the patient. Yeah, exactly. You must not touch the patient. But it's a bit like you guys saying sore knee, radiology, please. You know, is it a bone scan for infection? Is it a CT for articular congruence? You know, all of those things. You need to ask a question so that that department can give you the answer to that question. And only do that if that's going to affect the outcome of what you do. Because just asking uh, scan, please, sore knee, they'll go, 
Okay. Well, it was funny in the webinar when you said, um, you know, you would never get a referral saying sore knee. No. And the next day, day you did. From ED, I got two by saying sore knee. Please, please do the knee. <laughs> do the knee. Yeah. <laughs> like, Jen, you yeah. know, quick. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Like, take your point. This is my every day. Uh, what is an MRI good for? What is an MRI good for? So tumor, really good. So again, a ACLs, get... meniscus. Yeah. <laughs> um, and signs around nerves that are going to suggest what's going on. So big hematomas. So you get a big cuff tear, a big subscap rupture or a fracture. You've got that big hematoma. So yeah. an ultrasound does much the same, but you often see that on an MRI. But I'm not going to look in there for nerves. There's lots of things coming along to look at again the anatomic function so there's tractography um, and there's diffusion MRI and that's clever maths saying normally we presume that the body's water that can move in any direction unrestrained hydrogen ions but we know within a nerve they can move not much side to side but an awful lot up and down so you tell the computer look for water molecules that right. do that a bit but that a lot and you can then find these tracts now we don't know what the beautiful pictures and we goes oh wow look nerves but we don't know if that's an empty Schwann cell, is that basement membrane, there's water molecules yeah. going up, up and yeah. down, but is that nerve, is that functioning? Is, is it relevant? Yeah. So ana we're not looking for the anatomy for the nerve, yeah. but we're yeah. looking at the anatomy, hematomas and tumors. So things around it. Yeah. So MRI neurography. Uh, will come, yeah. yeah. But like it's, right out of Star Trek. It's, well, it's there and people have beautiful pictures and they get yeah. published but I'm not sure that they help me. It doesn't tell you anything, does it? No, it, 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 it's a nice pretty picture for a talk, but I'm yeah. not sure necessarily you can relate that to clinical Function. questions and yeah. clinical outcomes. Yeah. Assessing sensation, mm. MTSP, we've done motion touch, sensation. How are you doing that? So again, this is, so all of this examination we're coming back to is the patient's experience. So there's not much, you can't do a Lachman's you know, or a pivot shift or, or whatever else on sensation. Lab, I like that. Yeah. Um, so you have to ask the patient. Yeah. So this is, this is where you say, look, how does that feel? Tell me where it's numb. Tell me where it feels and describe. And it's yeah. receiving a history. It's not a, really an examination. But you might want to map that out and say, look, the back of your hand, it's there. Is it also here? So are we looking at a C6? Are we yeah. looking at a radial nerve or a median nerve? And it was this subjectivity that really upset me and drove me towards motor because um, I thought motor was going to be objective. You could measure force, you yeah. could do, do those things. That would be a very um, observer-dependent thing. But I recognise more and more that's not linked with subjective experience. People don't care what their peak force is. Again, you know, it's like a really old thing. What's the heaviest thing that you can lift? Ah, but actually you want to know that you can clean your teeth and make a cup of tea. Yeah. So that's, it's all subjective. So there's not that much. What I want to do is hear from the history where it's numb, where it's tingly, where it doesn't feel right. And yeah, you might want to even just give them a pen right. and say, could you draw the but area that feels up Because when we, when we trained, the patients were pretty passive in the process. Mm. It was like, close your eyes and don't say anything until yes. I tell you. Yes. And then, so are you not carrying bits of cotton wool and these and two-point discrimination? So, sharp things so very rarely do I look at differential sensory testing because I think it's, again, it doesn't really matter to me when you're mapping down vibration and two-point discrimination, We've shown that these are not that reproducible yeah. for a start. All of those tools don't really work. Moving two point, two point sharp. The yeah. most important thing, the patient knows what's going on because that's what they're coming to you with. Yeah. They will generally tell me pain, 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 and then dysfunction. So they can't separate with shoulder, elbow, sensory. They just say, look, I can't do up my buttons. You then got to apply and work out, is it stiffness of the MCP joint? Is it numbness? Is it weakness? Is it discoordination? But it is, it's, it's, it's hearing that. And then working your differential, it is all, it is all old school medicine. And th this, to get back to why, this is what really appealed. Okay. And, and can you tell me this, you, you, you've talked about the Tenel Hoffman test. Mm. I'm giving Hoffman his dues. Basically, yes. Pete, this German guy um, described it and published it six months before Tenel. But basically, oh, I think it, cause it was 1915, it's because of World War II. Right. Basically, everyone discredited, discredited the Jerry's, sorry, the Germans, um, and gave it to the French. And some British guy basically met the World French War. guy. World War One. One, sorry, did I say two? My bad. Sorry, World War One. Um, respect to Captain Tom Moore. And basically, they just uh, and so they, the German guy got completely discredited, even though he came up with it first. Published right. It twice. So I'm going to call it the Tinnell Hoffman test from now on. Yeah. Not that I'll ever mention it again. Did but Rolf Birch ever make a thing of that? Yeah, oh, that was that was one of his thing. things. Was it? Another big thing. Where was right. Rolf from? What nationality was he? 
Rolf, British. Rolf, uh, English uh, as you oh, like. Sorry, sorry. He, Scottish, British. Scottish, right. And uh, uh, Tanel, so he's French, was he? Jules. Jules. And, Jules. Okay, and any any factoids on Tanel? Any any interesting things around him? Or indeed Hoffman? Uh, no, nothing at all. Just history. Nothing in the box. French with nothing in the box. I thought you were a historian. Yeah, so um, Tanel, as I, because I'm just not sure of the truth of these things. You put them out, it's then permanently there. So I think Tanel um, did his the majority of his work when he was a prisoner of war, I believe. So I do yeah, think, I, 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 I do think that this, yeah. So I think that this is a period, again, I think that's that's why the German-French relationships were, yeah. it was a bit sort of French, no, two uh, fingers up well, to the Germans. Tenel's son right. got, um, they don't do the two fingers, do they? No, no, that's, that's English. So well, I did read that Tanel used to hide um, prisoners of war. And then his son would smuggle him out of the country. And then his son got uh, imprisoned by the Nazis and got killed in a concentration camp. So you can understand why Hoffman might not have wanted. Yeah. yeah. I thought Hoffman's, 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 Hoffman's fault. Do you know Hoffman's first, first name? name? Have a guess. Uh, Wolfgang. Wolfgang. No, Paul. Paul. Paul Hoffman. <laughs> so, so, um, John. How do you do your Snell's test? Is it literally two fingers tap? Two fingers? No, just just the one. Just the one. Just the one. So, one so, finger tap. Yeah, exactly. You can do that. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm percussing my ribs as everyone. Does. Yeah. <laughs> so start distally. Yeah. So you need to be really clear again with your instructions for the patient. I'm looking to find if there's tingling in this area. So draw out, show them where you're expecting. So median, it might be the thumb and the index finger yeah. or wherever. And then tap along the cord. So you've got to know where, where the nerve runs. Yeah. So you then start from distally and work proximally. Yeah. And then, and kids again are really good at this. And you can say when it starts to sparkle or tingle. And the kids are brilliant at this because they'll go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And they'll tell you exactly. So you tap up and it, and then you mark that point, so but you keep going. You're using one finger. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and you tap in, how many taps do you do in a certain place? Ooh. Is it's kind of a like regular it? distribution of okay. equally placed percussive. Okay, I just kind of tap, no, tap, 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 tap. Allegedly. Yeah. 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 Until they go there. Uh, yeah. Oh, got yeah. it. Oh, and it's amazing. And it's and it is. It's it's a very reproducible sign. It's got good intra and inter observer reliability. Okay, so, so it's if a your really reg, good if thing. Your reg does it in the clinic. It's in the letter. Yeah. Yeah. Then but you've got to, you can trust it. Y- so definitely with a positive, I think there's lots of false negatives, but there's hardly, so there is a false positive, there's a pseudo tunnel sign. So this is what the medics do. So carpal tunnel, Jules Tunnel and Paul Hoffman described after trauma that this happened. So this is specific, that it's after a traumatic nerve injury. So this is not nerve compression. So what we get in nerve compression is relative nerve hypoxia. And we've spoken about this, that this strangled nerve. So a bit like, um, when axons are hypoxic, they like to fire off. And that's what the uh, autoerotic asphyxiation thing is all about. Do you remember that with the Tories? Yeah, 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 the Tories. He died with an orange in his mouth. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that there is that rapture of the deep. So you, you, get, hypo- <laughs> you get hypoxic yeah. and your axons fire off. Right. So that happens in areas of compression. So what happens in areas of compression is, 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 is that axons get excitable because they're starting to strangle. But also, again, you get clearance of the Schwann cells, just like we said with the compression, that they start to make a naked axon. So you've got a naked, excited axon, you tap on it, it likes to squeal. But that's not nerve injury, that is not a degenerative, okay. that's not a sign of a, of a growth cone, that's just yeah. a sign of a hypoxic, pressurised nerve. So that is a pseudo and essentially is a false positive, because there isn't a growth cone there, it's not going to advance, because yeah. that's the yeah. area of train track that's upset. Yeah. Right. You've got to explain nerve conduction studies okay. in, a, in a nutshell to idiots. Fine. So neurophysiology, again, pet hate. Everyone says nerve conduction studies. There are three essentially major parts to ne- neurophysiology. Number one, nerve conduction studies. Yep. We'll cover that. Number two, EMG, yep. electro myography myography you were going to get my you're Worcestershire I've got the edit I've got the edit button I'll stand in the genius at the end of this and then as I've said they look at the big big fibres so we've got tests for the small fibres which is QST quantitative sensory testing Okay, so right. we'll talk briefly about QST, but the big thing is those two. So NCS, nerve conduction studies, and EMG. So nerve conduction studies is just looking at the signal. Okay. So you stimulate and you record along a length of nerve. You time it, so it's a bit like 100 meters. Yeah. Plus, yeah. So you say how fast and how loud. Loudness is about how many tubes you've got to shout down. Okay. okay? So if you've got axonopathy, if axons have died through 
medical neuropathy, axonopathy, or through trauma, that you've had a degenerative nerve injury, less axons, less amplitude. Axonomesis. Exactly. So axons die, so yeah. less tubes down which to send right. signal. So if amplitude is down, that's an axonopathy. You've lost tubes. Okay. Okay. If speed is down, that is compressive. So again, we're just looking at the top side. So you've got the normal distribution. You've got the fast, noisy axons. Mm -hmm. So if you take those out through compression, mm -hmm. speed drops. That's not like the whole population have been reduced. It's just a sampling error. You're only looking at these fast ones, okay. but you've taken them out, and the rest of the population are slower. Okay. Yeah. So slowing can occur either because of knockout of those fast fibers or that you've lost myelin. So what we see, for example, in a carpal tunnel or a cubital tunnel is just like we said, the pressure creates myelinopathy. Yeah, so you okay. don't get the saltation reconduction. So those big fast fibers have it's dropped away and you're left with the rest of the population of slower fibers. Okay. So that's nerve conduction. Amplitude, volume, which is axonopathy. Speed, speed. which is essentially, in our world, compression. Yeah. yeah. Right. EMG, very quickly. That's to look at the neuromuscular junction. So the nerve connects to the muscle, the plug into the muscle, and that determines what type of muscle that is. You still let the nerve and you look for some muscle response. No. So the first... Yeah. <laughs> so this isn't generally... I'm, I'm not speaking for the rest of this podcast. So you can do motor nerve conduction studies, but that's nerve conduction studies. So what we're looking here is muscle function. Okay. So what you want to do is you take a needle. So you need to do it from the surface, but generally it's a needle into the muscle. So you put a needle into the muscle, and that muscle can then look at a sphere of muscle tissue around it. Think of the muscle as a classroom, Okay. There's all the kids there doing the work and there's the teacher. The teacher's the neuromuscular junction. So she's gonna say, quieten down everybody, do your work, okay? So when someone walks into that room, your needle comes into the muscle, the kids all look around, there's a, a brief kerfuffle, but because the teacher's there, they then settle back down to work. So there's insertional activity, you put a needle into a muscle, it fires off, mm -hmm. but then it settles down, there's no spontaneous activity. Yep. And then if the teacher says do work, work happens. So that's motor unit action potentials, M-U-A-P. Okay. In a de-innovated muscle, you've strangled the teacher and she's been dragged out or left there and necrosed. What's going to happen to the class? Or she's fallen asleep. Or yeah. she's fallen asleep. Well, but that's conduction block. She's still uh, there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was just trying to make it kid-friendly. So we've, okay, well, so we've <laughs> strangled <laughs> on Zoom. We've strangled. <laughs> yeah. So the teacher's necrosing on the, on the floor. What's going to yeah. happen to the kids? They're going to go crazy. They, they go nuts. Fights, paper aeroplanes, someone's setting fire. Lord that's flies. So yeah. that's yeah. spontaneous activity. That's fibrillations and positive sharp waves. So you put a needle in, you're going to see spontaneous activity. So the muscle's just <laughs> messing about. Because yeah. there's no neuromuscular junction. Okay. So that's pathognomonic of de yeah. So the axons died, the neuromuscular junctions died. Control muscle's loss. doing its own thing, yeah. control lost. Okay. Right. Then you get re -innovation. So you get a supply teacher. Supply teacher comes in. She gets control of the teacher's pets at the front of the class. Yeah. So there's a tiny bit of work. There's some MUAPs. Yeah. She's an awful teacher, or he's an awful teacher. Yeah polyphasic MUAPs, they don't look right, okay? okay? Yeah. And there's still the rest of the class asking still about. going nuts. So there's still there's some spontaneous changes. activity. Yeah. Okay. But the area that she started to control is doing work. And you'll never get, the supply teacher's never going to get that back to normal. Full control. So you're always going to get, you'll slowly get control of the class, so you'll get re-innovation of the whole muscle, spontaneous activity will die away, but you'll always get MUAPs that are abnormal. And the recruitment will be abnormal, so you ask them to do more work, they're less good at it. Yeah. That fatigue thing we told you about. That it doesn't a supply teacher thing, right? it's, a yeah. tough, it's a tough gig being a supply teacher, though, isn't yeah, it? it is, that's, yeah. a, that's a tough gig. Yeah, exactly. And you've got, you know, you've got walking those in and giving in the apple keen to do work, and then right. idiots right. at the back of the class. To, like, to, to walk in and, well, like you know, all of us, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah, give an inspiring talk, you know, inspiring no, lessons. Right. To, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so that's, so that's the MG. Yeah. Pretty much what I said. Yeah. And then... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and then if you want and to briefly do the QST... So can that, you do it in a sentence? I can do it in a sentence. It's, it's looking at measuring when you feel uh, vibration and temperature and sweating. So the tools you can use to say, when do you feel warm? When does it become painful? And that's the triggering of these smaller populations of sensory cells. So it looks at those small fibres and it helps okay. you look at small fibre. Is that a common test? No, it's that specialist. Yeah, you'd ask for that. Yeah, yeah, but sometimes, very, yeah. very, very rarely. Okay. But it's, but it's a useful tool. We just I'm, don't use I'm it. I'm going to start asking for it. Okay. Okay. But, but fundamentally, in outside of the hands of a P and I person like you, how how useful? Because I yeah. I've I've booked many a nerve conduction study yeah. in my clinic, and not once do I ever feel that I've acted upon the, the result so I of think it. To me, is it, is it, it's, may, I interrupt, may I ask? Is it a sign of desperation when you're doing that? Not desperation. It's it's more. 
Because actually, usually you do it in the setting of a nerve that you, you know to be in continuity. Okay. And therefore, I perceive, maybe wrongly, yeah. and we'll come to this in a minute, mm-hmm. I perceive that someone like Tom would have no interest, not no interest, but he would not he would not be treating this operatively, he'd be observing it. Yeah. So I might as well observe it as well as he is. And I'm just biding my time. I'm, it's idle hands. I yeah. just can't bear to do nothing. Okay. Therefore, I will Got do it. a nerve conduction study because it makes me feel like I'm doing something, yeah. even though I have no intention of acting on the re- and result. And you're hoping that it's going to support your, your theory? Yes, your but, but even when I get the result back, I don't know whether that supports my theory or yeah. not. So I think it's... Order a test when you have two choices that you're going to make and that will give you an answer to A or B. Yeah. So, you know, you've done an ACL. You might get an MRI afterwards to look how beautiful it is. Then you won't get an MRI in three months' time to see, is it still beautiful? Because it's not going to change what you do. You might say, oh, the patient's now got a more unstable knee. This is part of my A differential. Is it still in continuity? There's a question to which that test is going to give you the answer. So neurophys is constantly used. So even in things like nerve compression, if you've got a decent story of a cubital tunnel or carpal tunnel, the clinical examination points you that, that way. I'm not that bothered if the neurophys is abnormal or not because we're treating a clinical entity. So it's, it, I think it is overused. And I think, again, it's a speciality where you've just got to engage with your neurophysiologist, pick up the phone and say, this is my question. Can you help me along that line? Or I think I think the challenge is that neurophysiology is pretty limited in accessibility, and they're normally delivered regionally. And the fact is, perhaps that's because partly there's a delay because lots of people are asking for it unnecessarily. Mm. Yeah, and I think so. I think it would be a really interesting audit to say what percentage of these have actually changed practice. So give me one scenario, yes. one scenario where a, a nerve conduction n- neurophysiology mm. is a total game changer. So when you think that, yeah, so when you think this is conduction block, okay, so you're saying, look, this seems to be, to me, something that's going to get better. Is this a degenerative nerve injury? Question. They can come back because we know if you see signs of de-innovation, it's, that's, it's degenerative. It, it is degenerate, okay? So if you've got a question where you're thinking, look, I'm not quite sure, is this a mild injury? And th- this is where this myth of you can't get anything before three months, you know, is this so that you must wait. There's an awful lot with the right question you can get early, but you're not going to see that sign of de innovation until that nerve has Wallerianly degenerated. So it will still continue on for a little bit. So certainly waiting six weeks and then looking for a needle EMG. If it's conduction block, there is no spontaneous activity. There's a teacher in the class who's just, she's not getting the lessons through from central control headmistress yeah. headmistress yeah. but whatever it is but brain. she's holding court she's holding court it's fine so in a conduction block there is no spontaneous activity that's really helpful so that right. will give so you that answer that's reassuring yeah yeah okay okay let's walk with practicality orthopedic surgeon what do we want to know what what to do if you find a nerve intraoperatively that either has been damaged from the uh, mechanism of injury or you've cut what do you want us to do? Yeah, so first thing, go find those nerves. I think everyone's very, very scared of, oh, I'm doing a posterior approach, a lateral approach to the humerus. Let's try and avoid, if we even set eyes on it, it yeah. will go on strike and get upset. Yeah. So please go find it. You can be relatively rough. You don't have to be absolutely delicate with these things. If they've survived the trauma, you can definitely mobilize it and have a look. So I think feel it. Feel along the length of it. Get to know what normal nerve feels like so when you see a nerve just give it a little squeeze and a feel and little how's your father exactly just to get your fingers used to what a nerve feels yeah. like then when you see one that feels like wood or stone you go that's an abnormal nerve that's yeah. over, over what length is this abnormal fingers are really you know that's why we wear one pair of gloves and you, you guys wear six two or six yeah. <laughs> um, Kevlar. so it's that it's that tactile thing's really important what length of nerve is is damaged i think it's really important to appreciate that it could be tethered way away so, you know, the radial nerve could be tethered right at the lateral septum with a, a fracture. So you've got to look for those common compression points. But if you find a nerve that looks ab- abnormal, try and get a picture. It's so easy nowadays. I know GDPR and things. I was amazed yeah. with that um, tool that we probably can't mention the name of. But there's now tools where you can take a picture. It goes directly to the electronic notes and doesn't store on your phone. You can right. store consent. So that's really helpful to get a picture. Sure. But to feel it, that's really important, is it just felt not right. You know, over 10 centimetres, I did the knee dislocation post lateral corner yeah. thing, and that's CPM. Well, it looked really thin, and it felt weird. 
it felt like just a fibrous bag. There was no nerve in it, or it felt really hard and yeah. stony. So that's really important. If it's cut, we don't need nerves tagging. I think all of us are pretty good at finding nerves. And the amount of times that I found a tendon tagged, you know, we found this <laughs> and it just, to be a it does, yeah, exactly. Oh, so, so you don't want to over crawl on a blunt round body needle. Yeah, yeah. Like don't take, nervous. don't <laughs> take your shoelaces out, lick the end, and try yeah. and bootlace it, it together. Yeah. There's no, there is no point in tagging that. So, okay. the only thing I think, if it's, if you're comfortable. There is nothing to stop you taking an appropriate sized suture, which for you guys is terrifyingly small, but for the majority of nerves, a 3-0, a 4-0, a 5-0, but an epineural stitch. It goes up to five? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because if you leave a nerve apart for yeah. more than a day or so, then that elect sorry, electronic elastic contraction is going to retract, that you're yeah. going to have a nerve. The minute you cut it, it boings apart. Okay. If you leave that for more than 36 hours, it, you're not. it's going to fibrose in that retracted okay. position. Yeah. But if you can put it together gently and you've got the skills for that, brilliant. And then necessarily, if you've got those skills, I don't need to do anything. The first time to do it is when it's there right in front of you. The what suture time. should I use if I'm going to do so it? So I would use, so again, it depends what you've got, but a non-absorbable, um, so we have special needles, an s &T needle, but any kind of needle, a cutting all round bodied, 5-0 will put you together. So you just pick up the epineurium, try and line up the veins on the top, and again, this is not something to just have a go at, but if you've done it and you're happy, the best time to do it is right there, right in front of you, because it will come back together under no tension and be nice and easy. It's a pain 12 hours later. It's nearly impossible at 36. Right. And then you've got to put a gap material and you've got to put a graft in. And, but, and, and, and you have a, a stepwise decline in, in, in recovery. Exactly. If you do it. Well, almost exponential. You know, you're losing stuff okay. quickly. And, and let's say someone isn't comfortable repairing a nerve, yeah. which most, a lot of people aren't. So you... Call you straight away. You just call. You just say, look, we've done this. And ideally, we'd like, you know, we are closing the wound. We've done our bit. So continue on with everything because that needs, whatever that yeah. was, needs to be done. Stability. And then get that patient to somebody who can stitch it back together. Whether it's calling a plastic surgeon in or a colleague who's done it or locally referring, but recognizing that really should be on table that next day. So start organizing getting them awake and getting transport to that regional center no, sorry, I, right. com I completely forgot about plastics <laughs> oh, yeah, so exist. one sentence responses yeah uh i've plated a humerus sorry i'm about to plate a humerus which is broken mm. but the radial nerve is out yeah what approach should i use should i absolutely see that radial nerve during the surgery, or can I just do an anterior approach? And uh, in the in the surefire knowledge, it's probably gonna la, la, recover. La, 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 la. Yeah. So yeah. So this is where what I would do is not necessarily what everyone is going to do. Now I would recommend because I use the approach an awful lot. It's an anterolateral extensile spiral uh, approach. It will show you that the nerve. You find the nerve. You move it. I'm comfortable with that. Just in the same way with my management of a supracondylar fracture, I'm happy going into an antecubital fossa, but many people aren't. So I would say do what you do, but recognize you're trying to treat two injuries. So you're not just ignoring a nerve injury and hoping it gets better. So you yep. need to get a diagnosis and really important information for a diagnosis. You said one sentence, it's so long, there's just no breathing or this, this, Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just go. <laughs> Comma. Yeah, <laughs> semicolon. <laughs> Virginia Woolf, had, she did sentences like a whole paragraph, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like 150 comments. Um, so, yeah, so, so gaining a diagnosis is really key, as we know it, nerve injury isn't yeah. a diagnosis, so you want to get information about that nerve. But I would prefer you saw a long length of that nerve, decompress the septum, you know, freed it up, saw it, felt it, and told me about it, or recognised. That's fair, isn't it? Yep, fine. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, how do you, f what, is a, what is a reliable way of finding a radial nerve? You can do it on yourself. I mean, if you, if you come, and again, I don't like lengths, I like percentages, because arms are a different size, and you say 12 centimetres. But if you come from the, lant from the lateral epicondyle, uh, you will just feel that, spiraling spiraling around around a third up the arm and it spirals from the back across and again it's just understanding landmarks so it's appreciated oh, yeah, yeah, if it, you take that it. yeah and it's a big it. thing it's like the size of your little finger <laughs> i can yeah? feel it if I, if I first yeah, twang, twang, twang. <laughs> so if you move in that oblique direction up and down you will yeah. feel this thing about the size of, it's a big you yeah, know well, nerves are everyone's always a bit surprised they're big the sciatic yeah. nerves huge yeah. yeah but that's you know and, it, and it's and it's palpated it's, it's used those skills even when i've gone through the skin, I'm still going to, again, those fingers in the single glove, 
you're able to feel where it is. It should sit in an intramuscular plane. It hardly ever does. It hides under one muscle or the other. And it isn't applied right against the bone, as everyone thinks on that radial groove. So just feel. Just go and know the anatomy and just go feel. Yeah. Okay. Now you Next call one. Call me the, the nerve whisperer. Radial nerve was intact at the start of the operation. Yeah. I did the operation. I did not see the nerve at all, but I'm pretty yeah. sure I didn't cut it because yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm wasn't reckless. Mm. But I, I, the X-ray looks great, by the way. But nerve is definitely yeah. out. Could you put your honour at the end of that sentence and be, <laughs> and, be and that's and that's the test, I think. The BOSE guidelines on on national institution guidelines are very very clear. If you've caught, you, you know, you've taken a, a knife and a drill and plates and screws into the area of a nerve, which was normal and now isn't, please presume you've cut, yeah, you drilled, have, plated it. Because you, to stand on you it. really don't. So yeah. I think if you have a change after a manipulation or a plaster change or application of an X fix or you know, you know any of those things, you have to, I think, with your responsibility say, just let me check I didn't mess that up. Okay. Okay. I, so, so I would say after that, certainly if it's painful, absolutely mandated. But I would say, from my view and the view of the BOA BOSE guidelines, if there's a change in neurology that was in the field of your surgery, you need to go back in, explore specifically that nerve to check. Okay. Because otherwise, you waste six, eight, ten weeks. And for anyone listening at home, the BOSE are the British Orthopaedic Association standards for trauma. You can Google them; they're all available. And this is yeah. one okay. Of the yeah. Got it. And there's a blue book as well. There is a blue book as well. So there's okay. the two basic, you know, you know tenants, um, lists of um, agreed protocols for yeah. nerve injuries. They're, they're really useful. With and we can, I'm sure we'll put those up on. Yeah, link. Well, okay. we'll, we'll link to those. Yeah. Good, Good idea. idea. Let's have a link. <laughs> I understand we can do that. Yeah, we can a little do box that. appear above it'll your head. There'll be the show notes yeah. below. <laughs> and and yeah. it'll be in the... Um, okay. I, I've, I've done an operation. Let's we'll stick with radial nerve. I've done an operation. I freaking well saw that nerve all yeah. the way through. I can tell you 100% it's not sitting under the plate. I did not cut it. I did not even, yeah. I, I, I hardly looked at it. People will say that, won't they? And yet, you know, I, but now it's not working. Okay. So again, what I really like is those op notes where you've got a picture and they've drawn the nerve lies over the second drill hole. I love that because it's like, look, they were aware of that, not just at the beginning, but when they left that wound, they said, look, there's the nerve. And they were thinking. Yeah. And so I, you know, Yes, in your heart of hearts, if you're happy to say, Your Honour, at the end of that, that's absolutely fine. I don't think you need to be exposing patients to needless operations. So if you're absolutely sure, hand on heart, I left that. It was lying over there. I yeah. know I went I'm up, not I, saw, I saw the intramuscular septum and I recognised that was a bit tight and I've released that. Then that's fine. You know, I'm not saying these are yeah. absolutes. And again, I think it's people that you can tell were calm and collected this is an operation I've done 10,000 times. And I've done this, I've done that, and that's fine. And look, I'm, I'm 100%, this nerve is okay. Then okay, you've retracted it. There will be no tenel sign. There will be no fibrillation and sharp waves. And in three months, this will wake up. If it doesn't, so we're doing our conservative treatment, which isn't yeah. just discharge of them. It's mastery inactivity and cat-like observation. Watchful waiting. Yeah. Watchful waiting. To say, if, if, if this is not fitting to my expectations, I'm going to do an investigation to work out why. And that's okay. when nerve conduction surgery. And that's exactly, as we said, that's that indication. It's, look, I was thinking this was conduction block, but hell, something's gone wrong. And three months for this? So, again, we've got that six-week period in orthopaedics. We all like that six-week yeah. clinic. Do it then at six weeks. Okay. Check that TINEL. Do our special test. Do yeah. our MTSP. If we're seeing no activity in the nerve, n no sympathetics, there's neuropathic pain, there's a TINEL, we've got this wrong. Yeah. yeah. So you're constantly saying, what is, I'm gathering all the information to try and fit a picture. If it doesn't, is that because that's wrong information and I can exclude it for this reason or that? Or, well, that's starting to make me think this diagnosis isn't right and I need to yeah. change it. Or call a friend. Call a friend. So guys, I'll, 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 hang put, on, hang on. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, just, I'll put Tom's mobile number in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last one. Uh, is there a nuance to the sciatic nerve at the hip? So for example... Uh, after a total hip replacement or a cochlear for an acetabular fracture, yeah. is there is are the rules slightly different or exactly the same? Yeah, so I've got this sort of synesthesia with with nerves that they're all colours. Yeah, so you know upper trunk sort of blue and middle trunk green and yellow and then lower trunk green. Sciatic nerve is red for me. But this is just an annoying nerve. It just causes so much trouble. Major problems. It's 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 a damn big nerve and it does an awful lot of high powered functions. It's very, very long, and we tend to injure it very, very proximally. 
why does the CPN always get it? So this does run. Yeah, I was, that was my, yeah. that was my last, uh, yeah. I said that was the last question. This, that's my last question. So the fibers run side by side within the same sheath, but pretty much side by side, a bit like triceps and radial nerve. You can often damage radial and leave triceps because they, you know, they kind of run together, but yeah. not the same. So the CPN is tethered. It's, it's on the outside, so it, it's slightly longer course, but it's tethered at the closest, so there's a shorter working length. And in nerve, we're talking about strain. So nerve can take about 8% strain. So you take a meter of nerve and stretch it to 1.8 meters, by 1.08 meters, then you've got a strain that's gonna cause damage. But if you're dealing with three centimeters, you've got a strain concentration there. So you've got a longer nerve to share the strain, it's much better. So the tibial nerve goes way down, you know, through that soleus arch, it's got a long length. CPM much, much less. So you stretch them both a centimeter, a much greater oh, strain okay. percentage. So you think it's the tether at the knee tether that, the makes, knee it, that makes, makes it that more vulnerable exactly. at the hip? So it's just got a shorter working length. And also, we always worry about, okay. about this knee replacement and then you're straightening the knee. You know, yeah. we talk about fixing it in, um, uh, you bandage them up and they give you more flexion. Mm. And keep the flexion on it. But it's a concern with a valgus knee. Yeah, but again, so do that with planning, appreciate that and think, should I just decompress that nerve? Should I get someone in to decompress that nerve? Because if you've done it and you've said, well, that's going to be a risk, but I've just hoped. And you're going to look a bit silly, but just say, look, this is a massively valgus knee. This nerve's got used to being short, the DDH hip. You know, why not think, let's prophylactically decompress nerves, get a greater working length, yeah. Yeah. because then you're going to be able to cope yeah. with more strain. And this is what I've said, that time and time again, it's because there's aberrant anatomy, that strain, for, there's a piece of fascia or there's a blood vessel growing through the nerve, and that really shortens the working length down. So you go and someone just neuralizes that, you do a hamstring repair, sciatic nerves all, 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 all tethered, you pull it up, you neuralize that sciatic nerve, you can pull the hamstrings up and fix them, no yeah. worries. Yeah. It's a bit like when, you do, when I do the postural corners, the fact is um, that's the place where I see nerves most stop commonly. And I've learned over the years is, you know, is just to go more proximal, find it normal. Exactly right, and yeah. Then just well, do what the boss always did when you were a trainee, extend the wound and find normal tissue. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that is trauma surgery, isn't it? It's get to normal anatomy, because it could be anywhere there. Yeah. Um, to try and start okay yeah. so so same question except this time you've got to answer it oh, i'm sorry so i do i do my hip replacement yeah. or my cockerlanger back yeah. and, and i've got i've got a foot drop afterwards yeah. uh what do i do so I, but I, i'm i'm absolutely 100 confident yes. that the nerve is intact so pain less palsy so we're going to deal first with painful palsy painful palsy work out what's happened so this is something you need to call someone that night, right? Say so, because that could that drop. could be that could be an expanding hematoma, exactly. or it could be or it could be a suture yeah. to a closure exactly. where you've tented the nerve. Exactly. So that that pain is telling you something. Listen, the patient will say, "I, I just can't have the bedclothes on there." Oh, don't touch it. It's burning. It's horrible. It's squeezing. Yeah. Yeah. So those things ring a bell. Deal with it. Go back in. Have a look. Yeah. Free up. Take the hematoma out. You know, get an ultrasound. Whatever. Right. Painless palsy. More complicated. I still think it is probably worth considering why this might have happened. Was it, as I say, DDH? And in which case you're thinking, look, have I over lengthened this? Leaving it stretched. If it's not painful, it probably isn't getting worse. So this is why I have that differential. So it's very difficult with an injury quite so proximally for us to do much at all. So the only time to make it better is probably early. So if you've got a huge offset, these are things I don't understand. But, you know, I will say, look, is that good? Was it easy? You know, where have your strews gone? Where have your retractors gone? If it was bog standard and it was a painless palsy, then we just have to wait. There's not much I can do. Yeah. Okay. Fine. We're, we're nearing, we're, we're almost there, aren't yes. we? Just stop haranguing the witness. Oh, <laughs> 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 damn you. Uh, that was a brilliant answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do you want to ask about nerve repair? No. No. No, I don't. Just, just stitch it with angel feet. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Teeny, teeny, <laughs> teeny, tiny. Okay. And wear special glasses for you doing. You are a brachial plexus guy, and um, one of the one of the one of the things that I think people find confusing about brachial plexus is not just that it's a junction box; is that you get different patterns of injury. Mm. And you alluded to this earlier on. Yeah. Uh, different patterns of injury depending on the level at which it gets injured, and that confuses people because yeah. it'd be at a root level, in which yeah. case you see fives and C six and, and and roots go down. Yeah. But or you can be 
Uh, you could be supraclavicular, but but distal to the root, yep. so in the trunks and stuff. Or you can be at infraclavicular level, or you can be right down at, at, at trunk trunk nerve level. Exactly. And yep. so each of those gives you a slightly subtly different pattern. So that's again back to history. It's back to examination. It's appreciating that this is anatomically complex, but actually not that difficult. It's easy when it's like most things. You know, if you do it all the time, everyone thinks this is witchcraft. It, it isn't. Yeah. It's a simple wiring diagram. I'm used to working out the wires. But yeah, so the thing that gets me the most is the infraclavicular injury, so the around the shoulder, after shoulder dislocation. Yeah. They can't lift their arm. It must be a nerve injury. So they've got, a, they might have an auxiliary nerve or a median nerve injury. The reason they can't move the shoulder is nothing to do with the suprascapular nerve because the injury's here. The reason right. they can't move their shoulder is that there's got a cuff tear or a GT yes. fracture. Got and it. that's missed. And then I get it and I say, okay, fine, I'll see them in six, eight weeks, you know going to let conduction block go, it's not painful, and I get them and there's this huge retracted cuff tear or whatever yeah. else, then we can't get them back in the system. So exactly that, it's appreciating where the injury is and what that pattern is, but the suprascapular nerve, obvi well obviously, suprascapular nerve is a uh, supraclavicular branch of the upper trunk and won't be injured generally in an infraclavicular stretch injury from a shoulder. Yeah. So that is nice. just that appreciation. Got it, got it. Got it. Some pain is just the fact it's a bit of a dumping ground diagnosis mm. for a patient who's got more, more pain than you'd expect and some kind of dubious skin color changes. And right. invariably, in a lot of places, they'll just get brought back to fracture link every six weeks until it, it goes away or they go away. Um, how how do we identify those that we can help? So, neuropathic pain or pain states generally, where the notes are this difference between nociceptive, so pain is a sensory appreciation, so nociceptive is this tissue injury, burns, fracture, whatever and the nerves are sensing it, or neuropathic, the sensory system's gone crazy, there's no problem, but it's telling you it's a problem. It's like the burglar alarm going off when yeah, there's yeah. no one in there. Yeah. So both of those, so complex pain states become a problem because no one really understands, no one takes history and examines. So it becomes, again, it's this thing I don't really like, just get rid of it, hide it. So I think, again, it's, it's listen to patients. When patients are crying out, yes, of course, there may be the patients with personality disorders and all of those other things that sometimes chicken and egg if you have complex neuropathic pain you're going to go a bit crazy yeah. you know it's it, people don't listen you doubt yourself so there is you know there's that back and forth yeah. but some people do just get labeled oh look you're a bit crazy but i think give everyone the benefit of the doubt if they say there's something burningly hot and wrong there probably is and it's working out why that is okay. but the those words crps do drive me quite crazy because it's it's that no, is a, so it's a diagnosis of exclusion yeah. So unless you know that you've excluded all these other diagnoses, then you can't call it CRPS. So I think as a first label, it's really dangerous because it's presuming this is a heterogeneous group of things that are unfixable. Whereas actually it's a very, sorry, it's presuming it's a homogeneous group, whereas actually it's a very heterogeneous group. And some of those that are labeled are as such are going to have cures, but you're pushing them all to just have some vitamin C and a mirror box and or whatever else. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Do, and, you, do you use this type one, type two? So again, that's been shown not to be correct. So if you take a skin sample on a CRPS that it doesn't have a nerve injury, you see diffuse axonopathy. Um, so as a diagnosis, it really troubles me because I don't think it's thing that we, it should be a specialist diagnosis. It's not the kind of thing we should all just label all oh, as a bit of CRPS. Because I think there are, as I, as I say, there is po symptomatic post-traumatic um, um, symptomatic post-traumatic <laughs> neuroma yeah, so this is a neuroma that's symptomatic. All cut nerves create a neuroma, but this one's creating pain, either spontaneously or evoked. There's neurostenalgia, there's that squeezing, screaming nerve. There is a post-traumatic neuritis, so just a percussive, you know, injury of the nerve, just inflamed and sore, but will get better. And then there's that causalgia, so there's a massive trauma, there's often a vascular injury, and there's just, a, you know, everything's gummed up and horrible, so it's kind of a bit like neurostenalgia. They're all not curable, but with a vast majority of those, we can surgically improve those. And so, that's, uh, that's neurolysis. And that's, well, so with any nerve, you want to try and restore continuity. So with a neuroma, number one, try and get it to grow back to where it was. If you can't, you've got to treat that neuroma. And that means a number of things. Take it, if it's spontaneously creating pain, cut it off because of scarring within that yeah. neuroma. Yeah. If it's evoked pain, so it's perfectly happy unless you go walking on it or tapping it, then it just needs to be put somewhere where it's going to be happier in a better oh, yeah. chemical or physical environment. Exactly, so stick it in muscle or yeah. whatever, but take it away from those physical traumas that are upsetting it. Or we've now got this thing called targeted muscle re TMR, 
where we can, instead of it allowing, so if you cut a nerve, it's going to form a neuroma. It's got nowhere to go, no train tracks. They're going to go crazy, make a mushroom. But if you can give them some extra train tracks that are into something nice, mm, muscle, it'll be perfectly happy. So you, we can get neuromata, plural of neuroma, of course, to, to not form. And this the hydra the, heads. Yeah, exactly, the hydra heads. So they're going to grow into muscle and create connections. Yeah. So that's a way, but with all the others, yes, it is taking a nerve out of a physical and chemical environment that is upsetting it. Yeah. So be nice to your nerves. Last thing. We've said nerve transfer. Times, times. Times, yeah. Or well, just, yeah. The yeah. five yeah. Thing, key yeah. things are. Five key things, yeah. The five, five, five last five, things yeah. are. Fifth, five, Nobody five expects points. a Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> <laughs> nerve transfer versus tendon transfer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely same principles. Okay, you're taking a function and using it for another function. It's got to be expendable function. So we all know, I'm sure, from exam revision, the basic principles of tendon transfer. It needs to be expendable. It needs to have an adequate amount of usefulness, function, fo function yeah, force, force, whatever it is. I'm yeah. going to apply this to nerves. It's not just force, but and and it's got to be synergistic, so that it's is that a little doubt. <laughs> so if you've got all of these things, then you can transfer. And we've got some set plays with tendon transfers. We're now getting set plays with nerve transfers. What you can do with a nerve transfer is more subtle. So we can steal a bit of function from, for example, a wrist flexor. flexor. It doesn't mean you then lose the wrist flexor because that hydra head's going to, you know, we're going to luxuriously re-innovate that wrist flexor. It will still work. But those axons that we've cut from the wrist flexor nerve and go into biceps will we'll do another job. So you can almost duplicate function. Right. And with the MRC grade, it's going to be the same. Patient's still going to go, that doesn't feel right and this doesn't feel right. But they've got, they can do it. so there's a trade-off, but it's, but it's, but it's better. Do, yeah. The downside is it's not that reliable. It takes time. So it's a bit like gardening. You've got your... your your vine wanting to grow, what you're doing with a nerve transfer is giving it a trellis along which to grow. You've got to wait for it to flower and then fruit before you get your function. So that takes time. So six six months, or well, between three, four, five, six to nine months with some transfers before the nerve's grown in, that new supply teacher's taken over, it's got the work going. So that takes time. Whereas a tendon transfer is reliable, it works directly afterwards. So it, it, it's about using them together, using them in different ind indications but you can't for example do a nerve transfer if that muscle's been de-innovated we haven't touched on this if the muscle's been de-innovated for too long and what is too long so probably a cut off it's probably different for different types of muscle and it's probably exponential so it doesn't really matter when we get into that tail whether it's nine months or 12 months but certainly by nine to 12 months we're not going to get any kind of function we get a drop off right so, you know, if you get an injury after two years and say, can you do a nerve transfer there? No, you can't. What you can do is take a new muscle, so take a free-functioning muscle transfer, take a gracilis with its blood supply and nerve supply, and give that a new nerve. Right. Because right. that's got, that started its clock of the innovation during the operation. The muscle yeah. So free-functioning muscle transfer. So that's the third. So we've got tendon transfer, sort of our old workhorse, which you can do any time, do that 10 years after an operation. Nerve transfer, you've got to do within that set period. It's got a time to grow. It's not 100% predictable. And then free-functioning muscle, it's like that further like a free step flat. up. Okay. It's like a free flap, but it functions to do function, not just look good. Yeah. So what's your favorite tendon transfer? Radial nerve. A, radial nerve injury is so easy to treat. As I say, it's really blunt tool, so it will get better, and patients don't mind it being a bit not great because it does what it has yeah. to, like the alligator's mouth. So that's a really easy function. You've got tenodesis as well for release of fingers. So if you get wrist, you get some release. But then I've got a really reliable tendon transfers to do exactly that. So I can get beautiful results by tendon that's transfer. So yeah. whatever happens with a ra radial nerve, I'll go, look, this is fine. I can deal with this on some point along my ability. I might fail, fail, but then I've got that great yeah. tendon transfer. Yeah. Um, ulnar nerve, nearly impossible to get a tendon transfer to give you useful function. So I'm really keen on nerve transferring for ulnar nerves, motor. Foot drop? Foot drop, we don't have, well, we do have a, a nerve transfer, um, but it isn't that great. So again, we can re that muscle. So we can take a branch from gastroc, take it around the lateral side and put that onto tibant. 
but it's not synergistic. It's exactly opposite. Yeah. So the brain, they almost all re-innovate. You get, you stick an EMG needle in and you can see MUAPs, but it, the brain just doesn't, it, it goes can't. mental, it can't, it's no yeah. use. So they end up co-contracting. Yeah. But whereas the tendon transfer, it works immediately. It's pretty good. It's never yeah. brilliant, but it's not bad. Again, you're yeah. taking an imbalanced foot with, dorsi, with plantar flexion and inversion and balancing plantar flexion with dorsiflexion and balancing l l lack of eversion with lack of inversion. So it's a nice to take a tip post and put it over onto the foot. It's got to be the toes as well, because I don't know if you've ever trodden on, on your big toe in flexion, but you Oh yeah, it awful. Kill a, kill a so gorilla. you can't give someone ankle dorsiflexion without toe dorsiflexion, because you get the tenodesis with yeah. your toes, you then tread on your big toe, and that's yeah, yeah. really painful. Great, that was a lovely answer. I'm just, I'm just waiting for Pete to say last question. Yeah. Last, one uh, well, just one more thing. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, I've learned a lot today. Genuinely, I've learned, I've learned a, a shed load. Yeah, yeah. I've, 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 I was pretending very to be good. an idiot, but even still, I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we did it yeah, so well, yeah, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Um, yeah. In, that case, in that case, Tom, thank you very much. I'm going to sign off with our um, one of my favourite quotes from the webinar, which was, hope is not a surgical strategy. Yep. And, of course. Um, We'll, we're gonna. Tom's gonna record some examinations for us, and so we're gonna uh, take your learning to. The, we're gonna turbocharge your learning to the next level. <laughs> okay. Um, good night, everyone. Pete, I'll see you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Bye.